just coming in, uh, but we can go ahead. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, good morning. Uh, so my name is Vicky Antonio. I'm a consultant working with the Urban Resilience Trust Fund. Thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, we're excited to hold this first of several roadshows that we will be held that will be held in collaboration with the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office in various priority countries of the Urban Climate Change Resilience Trust Fund or UCCRTF. So uh, just to just so everyone knows, UCCRTF is closing this year after 10 years of implementation. The roadshow intends to highlight the achievements emerging from projects implemented by the trust fund and how these interventions support the residents in the cities where we have worked to improve their resilience to the adverse impacts of climate change. Today we will feature the trust funds activities in the Philippines in the Philippines. In the coming months, we will be organizing similar events in other priority countries. Each event in the series will feature UCCRTF inventions in the different countries. It will bring together implementers from various ADB projects supported by UCCRTF and other local development partners to exchange insights. Participants will include representatives from national government, agencies, uh, local governments, communities, and civil society organizations. Okay, so that's our welcome. And uh, so before we begin the event proper, uh, just setting out some house rules. So requesting our guests to please keep your phones in silent. If you need to take a call, uh, you may uh, uh, please take it outside. And then we also have flowing coffee, tea, and water in the back uh, in case you need refreshments. And also after each session, we will have um, an allotted time for Q&A so that you can have an opportunity to, en to engage with our panelists. But this is also a hybrid event. So our we would like to invite our participants who are joining online to also please share their questions um, in the chat box. So on that note, I would like to introduce Mr. Pavit Ramachandran, Country Director of the Philippine Country Office of, the, of ADB. He has over 25 years of international development experience. Okay, someone has to mute it. Is it muted? Okay, thank you. Uh, so sorry. So he has more than 25 experience, 25 years of international development experience, including a combined 19 years with ADB. Uh, he's been working in Southeast Asia and East Asia. He has a sectoral proficiency in agriculture, natural resource and environment sectors, and experience in leading regional programs in the greater Mekong subregion, Brunei or the Bimp Iaga area, and the uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand growth triangle. So with that, I'd like to invite Mr. Ramachandran to please take the stage. Thank you. Maganda Namaga, pleasure to see you all. Uh, I understand uh, Ambassador Lord Bofis would be giving a, a recorded speech, so I want to just say hello and recognize her. Uh, a director's advisor, Shan Mitra, who's I think one of the architects of the UCCRTF, is also online. So Shan, uh, good morning to you and thank you for joining. A very warm welcome to everyone gathered here today. Um, special guests from the Philippine government agencies, I think DNR, DOH, um, we have, uh, I believe also from the PPP Center colleagues here. From the UK FCDO, colleagues from the FCDO, British Embassy, and invited speakers. It really is a pleasure to open this series of knowledge and lessons learned, lessons sharing events, a collaboration between ADB and FCDO, which we are proudly kicking off here at ADB, and I'm very glad it's in the Philippines, uh, given my obvious bias here. Um, and it's all about sharing what we've learned and getting even better at what we aim to achieve as a climate bank. The Asian Development Bank has now positioned ourselves to be the regional climate bank for the Asia and the Pacific. As we bring together the minds and efforts from various UCCRTF projects, it really feels less like a formal meeting and more like a gathering of 
committed partners and colleagues dedicated to a common cause. The UCCRTF has been a remarkable journey, a 105 million initiative that has brought us together to protect and empower the most climate vulnerable populations in our rapidly expanding cities across Asia. I'd like to especially extend our gratitude to FCDO, SECO, and the Rockefeller Foundation for their generous support in this mission, and certainly to our both our national as well as our local government partners for their sustained participation. Today, we are here to mo do more than just present findings and results. We are here to weave together the multitude of experiences and lessons we have learned from over 70 projects supported by UCCRTF that have touched the lives of around 2 million urban poor and vulnerable people. This is a significant achievement. And we've also leveraged about 1 billion in resilience investments, combining public and private resources to safeguard our communities. With support from the Trust Fund, we have strengthened cities through technical assistance, knowledge building, and financing operations. We've introduced a more holistic approach to urban planning and infrastructure development that can better withstand the challenges of climate change. The impact of our collective work has been profound, not just in terms of more resilient structures, but in the strength and capacity of the communities and institutions we serve. As we delve into the discussions today, let's all celebrate our achievements and also look to the future. How can we build on this momentum? How can we ensure that our work continues to resonate and grow, reaching over even more people and creating more resilient urban landscapes? The stories we share today are the foundations upon which we'll build an even resilient tomorrow. Thank you all for being here and let's make the most of this opportunity to learn, share, and inspire each other towards even greater achievements in urban climate change resilience. Maraming salamat po. Thank you. Thank you very much, C.D. Ramachandran. So our next speaker, next speaker is Ms. Lor Bofis, His Majesty's Ambassador to the Philippines and Palau. Unfortunately, Ambassador Bofis um, is unable to join us today, but she has prepared a video presentation. Um, so Ambassador Bofis was the Deputy Director for the Middle East and North Africa of the Department of International Development from 2019 to 2021, and the Deputy High Commissioner to Nigeria from 2017 to 2019. Prior to taking on this position in the Philippines, she worked in various positions in the UK government, including her work with the British Prime Minister in his role as co-chair of the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on the post-2015 development agenda. She ran the DFID's Department for Overseas Territories. So please, um, uh, may I ask Shillette to play the video of Ambassador Bofis. Participants, dear friends, yeah. it is my great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to each of you in this Urban Climate Change Resilience Trust Fund knowledge sharing event. According to the World Bank, around 56% of the world's population, or roughly 4.4 billion people, currently live in cities. In the Philippines, it is about 52 million people, or 51% of the population, that live in urban areas. And Manila is the world's most densely populated city. But as you know, the number of city dwellers is expected to double by 2050, with seven out of 10 people living in urban centers. This begs a huge challenge. How do we as cities deal with this rapid urbanization? The urbanization growth curve will increase pressures on many urban centers and will continue to expose cities to great social, economic, and environmental challenges. These include overcrowding, air pollution, increasing inequality, lack of social services, uncollected waste with co-related health hazards, and many more. Commensurate with this challenge, of course, is that of climate change. This will be felt by cities with rising temperatures, sea level rise, water so shortages, flooding, including flooding that many of the cities represented today have already felt. While these challenges may seem daunting or even overwhelming, the good news 
is that there is much that cities can do, and there's much that cities have indeed already done. Over the past decade, we have learned a lot about fostering urban resilience and adaptation. And while each city is unique and possesses its own set of climate hazard risks and vulnerabilities, there are lessons that apply to all of us. One such lesson is that strong resilience requires city governments to work across ministry boundaries and budgets and collaborate with the private sector and civil society organizations. Together, they must develop the shared understanding of where vulnerabilities lie. This is why this knowledge sharing event is so timely. It is important that we bring together various sectors of society to hear the stories of the Urban Climate Change Resilience Trust Fund over the past years. This is our chance to share some of the lessons learned from the program and consider how we can continue to improve our adaptation and resilience work. I'm very pleased that you will be joined today by Charlotte Coles, the head of the UK's Indo-Pacific Regional Department, John Warburton, who is leading the UK's climate work in the Indo-Pacific region, and our very own climate team from the British Embassy Manila. As the UK, we are committed to support interventions that enhance resilience of our ecosystems, communities, and economies, while also establishing pathways for net zero and a just energy transition. This is why we are delighted to be partnering with the ADB on this initiative and key programs such as the UCCRTF. Indeed, the ADB is leading the way in financing urban resilience and adaptation efforts, but also in incorporating climate considerations across the full spectrum of its work and operations. As we celebrate National Climate Change Conscience this week here in the Philippines, I could not think of a better time to discuss these critical issues. I wish you an excellent event, and I look forward to hearing all about it. Mabuhay. Thank you very much to Ambassador Bofis and her team for preparing the video. So before we go ahead, uh, we will have a photo op. So I would like to invite our guests to please come up here. Marino, Shalet, please direct our guests so that we can do it um, quickly. Marina. I'm gonna I think we should go right. Oh, <laughs> Okay. Um, 
Okay, thank you very much. So please, uh, again, take your seats. So just a reminder also for our online participants. So I, if you notice, we sent you several Teams links. So in the event that the connection drops, please just log on to the next um, Teams link. All right. So before we proceed to the program proper, um, I would just like to acknowledge our special guests who are here today. So, of course, you saw Mr. Pavit Ramachadran, Country Director of the Philippine Country Office. Uh, Mr. Sean Mitra, uh, um, he is the Director's Advisor for ADB Board of Directors and also the Architect of UCCRTF and URTF. Uh, Sean, if you could just turn on your camera so people could see you. There you go. Hi, Sean. Okay, so Sean is joining us virtually. Unfortunately, he's un feeling not too not feeling too well, but thank you for taking the time to join us. And then, of course, Charlotte Coles, head of Indo-Pacific Program, UKFCDO. Please stand up so people could see you. And of course, John Warburton, senior responsible officer in the Pacific Program, UKFCDO. Thank you very much. And then also our other partners who have joined us today. Uh, please give them a round of applause as I call out the agencies. Uh, so the, from the Philippine government, uh, from the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, Department of Housing and Urban Development, Department of Health, the PPP Center, and the Basis Conversion and Development Authority, and the League of Cities of the Philippines, and our partner, the Philippine Rural Reconstruction Movement. Let's give them a round of applause. And of course, our colleagues from ADB. <laughs> and last but not least, FCDO, FCDO Philippines. Okay, so with that, that rounds up today's opening ceremony. So I would like to call on the moderator of the first session uh, on UCCRTF program results. This session will be led by Mr. Hong Su Lee, Senior Urban Development Specialist, uh, Water and Urban Development Sector Office of the Sectors Group in ADB. Hong Su is a smart city expert with a background in urban policy, planning, and development. He brings his extensive experience to support bank-wide initiatives and projects in urban development. Before joining ADB, Hong Su worked at the Seoul Housing Corporation and the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Transport in the Republic of Korea. And he also brings with us his experience working at the Urban Redevelopment Authority in Singapore. So Hong Su, uh, please come up here. Okay, thank you, Vicky. Um, good morning, distinguished guests and ADB management and uh, colleagues. This is Hong Su, who is the moderator for the session one. Uh, it's about UCC LTF uh, program results, and we'd like to invite the implementing partners in Philippines uh, to listen. Uh, the key results and longer term, uh, the expected longer term impacts and the lessons from uh, the implementation of the UCCLTF projects. So before we invite the panels who collaborated with the UCCLTF and ADB, please allow me to provide a quick overview uh, of the UCCLTF. 
Uh, next slide. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, our country director Pavit uh, covered most of the parts, so I will just uh, brief about the UCCLTF. It's a 105 million trust fund uh, supported by multi donors like FCDO, SECO, and Rockefeller Foundation, and administered by uh, ADB. Uh, it's a uh, for 70 project over 35 cities, and then the resilience uh, measures uh, protected around 2 million poor and vulnerable people. Next, please. Yeah, the fund is aimed to next. Yeah, slide, please. Yeah, the fund is aimed to scale up the investment in urban climate change resilience especially um, for the urban poor across the secondary cities in Asia. And we prioritized eight uh, developing member countries in Asia. And then as you see the banners uh, around uh, the venue, I think um, the leverage is um, about 1 billion in resilience investment from public, private, and municipal sources. Next, please. Next, please. Yeah. Yes, uh, UCCRCTF supported a project in Philippines, including community led uh, resilience projects at various locations, including Del Carmen. We are inviting uh, the uh, mayor uh, virtually, I mean, through the video clips, and sustainable tourism development project preparation at El Nido and Coron in Palawan and emergency assistance for reconstruction and recovery of Marawi, and review of a uh, nuclear city master plan, and water resources assessment, and uh, enabling local PPP projects as well. So as such, we'd like to invite the main implementers of the successful uh, project in Philippines. So um, I'm going to have uh, two rounds of the questions. First one is about the general, and second will be the uh, specific one um, uh, to the panel members. First, uh, please allow me to invite the director, Elenida Basuk, at Department of Environment and Natural Resources, DNR. Uh, Elena Basuk is the director of Climate Change Service and Concurrence Director of the Gender and Development Office of the DNR. She has been with the DNR for more than 38 years and sits with the Cabinet's Cluster on Climate Change Adaptation, Mitigation and Disaster Risk Reduction. So, yeah, please let me ask about the um, UCCLTF project in DNR, uh, based on your experience, what is the key result and um, impact, longer term impact? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes, I can maybe introduce all first. So, second, yeah, panel is um, engineer Carmela. Lua. She is leading um, the environmental health cluster of the Department of Health in Ch Northern Ch Mindanao. Ch An engineer by profession, Carmela, please. Yeah, Carmela uh, heads the technical working group on the procurement of the health facility infrastructure program, supported uh, through the ADB emergency assistance for the reconstruction and recovery of Marawi projects. And then uh, please let me introduce and invite the Vice President uh, Erwin Kenneth Ch Peralta. He leads the agencies in pivotal decisions on business development contract with uh, reputable local and international companies ensuring um, they are the most advantages for the Philippine government. And the, for the last, uh, please allow me to invite the Deputy E.D. Eliezer Rukote, who is the Deputy, um, Deputy Executive the Director of the Public, Private and Partnership Center, a career executive uh, officer 
Eliezer has more than 15 years of uh, technical and managerial experience in infrastructure and development project of uh, national and local government. So my uh, first quick general uh, question is, um, maybe I can stand, I'm okay. <laughs> so first question is, um, based on your experience for the, through the UCCLTA project, what was the key result and the uh, impacts uh, from uh, your experience? So, yeah, if I can start it, thank you for this opportunity to share with this crowd. Uh, the initial experiences that we have had at the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, of course, in partnership with our uh, public and private partnership, uh, NEDA, uh, the Economic Planning Ministry of the Philippines, in this endeavor. And as I do that, I'd like to be able to flash quickly uh, what had been done under the project. Uh, uh, at the outset, I'd like to say that it is too soon, perhaps, to say any long long-term impacts the project had because the project just started in December 2022 with outputs of the project generated in first quarter of this year, 2023. Uh, and uh, the project is, is, is such that it developed resilience roadmap for 12 climate vulnerable provinces in the country and uh, four major urban centers in the country. Again, in partnership with the public-private partnership program of the NEDA, public-private partnership center of the NEDA, through a technical assistance from the ADB under the UCC uh, RTF. No? And what it did was to have run through resilience road mapping, risk assessment, uh, as guided by our uh, Department of Human Settlements and Ur Urban uh, Development uh, uh, guidelines. And it tried to dwell on uh, dwelling on the resilience road mapping for 12 climate vulnerable provinces in the country and four major urban centers as part of the priority concerns of the cabinet cluster on climate change adaptation, mitigation, disaster risk uh, reduction roadmap. And these are such provinces in the country. It developed a resilience roadmap in that regard and uh, uh, it uh, went into doing this, uh, identified climate and disaster vulnerabilities in those provinces. It likewise developed investment portfolio for risk resilience for these 12 climate vulnerable provinces and four major urban centers. And as it did that, in fact, uh, we see that we were able to have been um, able to uh, mentor a number of these provinces, primarily from the Cordilleras, develop expanded bankable proposals that we've tried to develop, in fact, as proposals for the People Survival Fund. And indeed, some of these provinces in the last meeting of the People Survival Fund uh, board uh, had been approved of the proposals. No? And therefore, what uh, to me, uh, the investment for for resilience developed under these different climate vulnerable provinces had been able to assist the provincial planners in the in selected provinces develop uh, the proposals for resilience measures that they need. And we have been able to mentor them until uh, such workshop uh, to have made them into the final meeting point for the, pub, for the uh, people survival fund processes. And therefore, uh, having been part of that, I see that as we were dealing up with this with these uh, different provinces, uh, I think there is increased uh, capacity from the provincial planners and administrators uh, that in all those, uh, we think that, that in all those, I think we, we had been able to, to seek some capacity in those uh, provinces to have enabled them to prepare uh, the proposals it needed to make them uh, try to see how best they could be assisted respond to the climate and disaster vulnerabilities in the provinces. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, I think, uh, okay. So I think the, so what we're saying is that, uh, uh, having seen how these different provinces uh, undertook the resilience roadmaps in the area, having identified this with them, with their local stakeholders, 
having identified them with the uh, local uh, provincial offices, in tandem with the national government agencies that they are dealing with, uh, and with the academe and civil society and private sector partners, I think we have been able to jointly identify what are the, the disaster and resilience needs in the area, and have been able to track uh, how best they can be uh, done uh, phase twice implementation for the next steps. I think that for all for now. Thank you, Director Elinita yeah, Pasu. Actually, uh, cover the, the next question is about the, the upstream resilience um, work as well. And then we understand um, uh, the impacts and key results and we um, wish to work with um, DENR for the future uh, project as well. And uh, please let me invite uh, engineer Karma, uh, Kamela, yeah. Okay, so can I read this one? Uh, so the, good morning. Um, the project came about because on May 2017, I would just like to see the background. Oh, that Marawi city in the uh, southern part island of Mindanao come under siege from violent extremist group aligned with the local and regional affiliates of the Islamic State of Iraq. So for five months, a battle between extremist forces and the Philippine military raids displ displacing ne nearly 400,000 residents and forcing them to leave their homes and livelihood. So in uh, the government of the Philippines requested the ADB to provide emergency assistance to support the reconstruction of Marawi. Thus, the emergency assistance for the reconstruction and recovery of Marawi project is structured to provide the government with immediate and flexible financing to implement programs, projects, and, and um, activities. So, the RRM comprises four outputs. Number three is for restoring water utilities and health infrastructure. And this being financed by a 5 million grant under the Urban Climate Change Resilience Trust Fund. So deliverable under the health component includes the construction of two local health units, procurement of medical transport vehicle and institutional and operational support. So the construction of the two local health units were for the city unit, city health unit in Marawi and the local health unit in the municipality of Lumbayanagi, Lanao del Sur. These two are envisioned as model health units that meet not just the national standard, but incorporating state-of-the-art features necessary in building back better. So among the building back better, we ensure that health service delivery, resilience and environmental sustainability and gender safeguards are put in place. For the health service delivery, the community and the local government in Lumbayanagi has have expressed the need for improved health services in the area. So prior to the construction of the new local health unit or ITU, an old house served as the new health unit without birthing services. So with the construction of the new RHU, the community and the local government envision and improve access to quality health services with reduced referral time uh, to 30 minutes, at least 30 minutes. So resilience, environmental, environmental sustainability, the resilience framework for the post-conflict post re reconstruction of Marawi and the other affected areas prepared under the direct charge of the EU CCRTF grant is to build back better infrastructure and to increase resilience of Marawi's socio-cultural ecosystem against future risks from national natural hazards, climate change, and resurgence of conflict. So the last is the gender safeguard. The project is categorized as effective gen gender mainstreaming at entry. It will deliver tangible benefits <clears throat> to the internally displaced women and girls and address the relevant gender issue. So I think that the key results that result that we are trying to see. Yeah, thank you and uh, for um, the UH is um, prompt um, implementation to improve the health conditions and um, through the cross-cutting project, including health, gender, and disaster risk management as well. Thank you. Please give a round of applause. Yeah.
and yeah, Vice President, uh, please. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, I see some of you have been to uh, New Clark City already, so it's the uh, next uh, wonder or the next uh, best thing that's going to happen in the Philippines. It's uh, 9,450 hectares, 60 percent will be green open spaces. I saw John over there. Remember, we biked around the 2.2-kilometer uh, river, uh, river park, uh, linear park, and uh, he was uh, much better than me biking. But anyway, <laughs> I would like to thank uh, UCC RTF for the financial assistance uh, given, th given to us to establish a framework for an urban resilience master plan for NCC, which we are doing and applying uh, right now. So the results of the... Uh, Urban Resilience Master Plan for NCC would be um, to establish uh, green areas alongside the river, which double as parks and flood retention areas. Um, we have a 2.2 kilometer linear park now, and it will lead to the uh, central park, which is uh, going to be the catch basin of the whole NCC. It is 45 hectares, and it will be uh, patterned like uh, with the help of uh, UK FCDO, uh, just like maybe Manhattan. So you'll have all the uh, CBD buildings around uh, the Central Park, so it will be the first of its kind in, in the Philippines. Next is the maintenance of the natural flora to preserve the areas rich biodiversity and create a distinct identity for the city. This we are staunchly supporting uh, endemic flora and fauna only. Uh, in uh, NCC, we will not introduce any foreign or uh, other kinds of uh, flora and fauna that may not be found uh, in New Clark City. Develop and take advantage of the river's natural capacity to detain floods, preserve the natural river flow and river meander, and ensure sustained future groundwater supply. Um, we would like to, uh, well, lessons learned from uh, Bonifacio Global City, which was developed by BCDA, um, we would like to have a, a better BGC in terms of developing uh, the CBD area uh, by pro also providing uh, affordable housing uh, inside uh, the city. I could not even afford a studio unit in BGC, and I work in BCDA. Uh, imagine that. That's very ironic. Uh, but uh, like I said, lessons learned, we are building affordable housing uh, and we have uh, already proposed to Congress and Senate for uh, transfer to leasehold to freehold rights. And hopefully it gets passed, uh, meaning we can issue CCT, condominium certificate titles. Uh, these are all vertical infrastructure and I uh, will be able to live also inside NCCC. Uh, uh, when that happens, priority will be given to the military, the Air Force, um, government uh, personnel, and uh, those working inside the base. Um, what we want is uh, NCT to be, um, how do I say it? Uh, all of you have traveled all around the world. Uh, the, the first impression that they're not in the Philippines. When you go in there, it's like, I've seen this before. I've seen this in... Uh, UK, I've seen this in the US. So we are replicating what uh, other countries have been doing or have done many years back uh, to New Clark City. So it is the biggest uh, parcel of land that the government has uh, right now. BCDA is the real estate, quote unquote, real estate company of the government uh, tasked to dispose of these prime properties. And uh, uh, focusing on NCC, they are the biggest uh, real estate we have right now, aside from Bonifacio South, Bonifacio East. We do have in Morong, Batan Techno Park, which we gave 100 hectares to uh, the Philippine Marines uh, to replicate and relocate them there because we took their land in uh, uh, Fort Bonifacio, very prime. We also have in Poro Point, uh, 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 up north in La Union, uh, John Hay, those areas have also um, uh, um, problems with uh, water supply, especially in John Hay, if you've been to Baguio, oh, uh, the houses are built left and right. Mountains, houses are there. 
uh, all houses have water pumps, all houses have water tanks, because they're all trying to, we are um, trying to avoid that inside John Hay. Uh, same with Poro Point, the uh, um, salt water has already uh, entered some of our uh, uh, deep wells. So we're also looking at desalination uh, in, in Poro Point. And I saw the sign from Marino, time's up. I wanted to talk more about <laughs> our plans, but later. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah, thank you, VP Kenneth. Yeah. yeah, we understand that the uh, support uh, from the UCCLTF to the mass plan of the uh, NCC, Nuclear City, could be one of the uh, cost effective um, um, yeah, methodologies uh, when you look at the longer term. So, because it's a really early stage, and actually for the 2 billion and 1 billion leverage the, for the people and the funding. Actually, we didn't count about the future uh, plan of the um, nuclear city. And then we believe that uh, based on BCDS experience for the Metro Manila, the BCG, the yes. Bonifacio, I think, um, yeah, we can see, we can expect the um, um, balanced approach, uh, city planning development in uh, nuclear city. So thank you. Yeah, and uh, please, um, <laughs> But all national local government agencies um, getting into PPPs in the key areas uh, that need help projects, project development, policy, even capacity building, even institution building. And of course, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that UCCRTF built on an existing technical assistance of the Asian Development Bank. To the PPP centers or this 2010. I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Ramon, who's been very helpful in us with the PPP center in pushing for all of these things. Quick summary of what we did and some of the insights. Number one is what Director Ellen mentioned. We put together a risk resiliency program. This is a uh, risk resiliency roadmap. It's like a database of the risk resiliency elements in key provinces, 12 provinces and four metro cities in the Philippines. Very good information as LGUs Local governments move into a more decentralized framework at the Bandanas ruling and A138, building into their development planning and programming, resiliency elements, inputs, and a good takeoff as well into assessing real projects we can support eventually as PPPs. And as mentioned by Director Ellen, some of the projects identified with this um, roadmap of resiliency inputs as elements have evolved to become viable for the People's Survival Fund. Some of them we followed through real PPP projects and some received unsolicited PPP proposals. So I think the main lesson there is getting our acts together, various agencies, both national and local, and DNR and PPP Center, getting our acts together, understanding common language of what are the risk resilience elements, components, integrated mainstream into planning, programming, prioritization. Thank you very much for that, UCCRTF. Moving forward with that, I think we need to look at other provinces, look at other, replicate the lessons in there, and look at other um, projects we can develop from there. Number two, of course, uh, the, the UCCRTF contributed to the PDMF. This is the pool of funds that the PPP Center is maintaining. This fund has been able to help prepare feasibility studies and some technical assistance to very important projects that you outlined earlier in the summary slide. Uh, this league what on um, project the ormok uh this league city bulk supply project the ormok quarter sanitation and the los banos uh ppp project all enabled by the inputs from the ucc rtf team and we're following through with the ppp centers technical assistance uh and support on the institution development portion we put together what we call knowledge but the challenge in the philippines is we don't have information of data that we can go back to and then use as reference into project planning and programming we put together with the help of the ucrtf a training program a formal module on mainstreaming climate adaptation such as risk resilience to ppps this is now a regular offering in the ppp programs capacity building program offered to both national and local governments and gocc's like clark here we also put together toolkits in mainstreaming climate change as such the risk management into uh, the PPP Center's uh, database of materials and resources that we use for our technical assistance. We also wanted to look at um, sector-specific requirements given the nuances of PPPs in key sectors, 
conceptual frameworks, sectoral strategies for solid waste management, and health PPPs. These are ready and will soon, and in fact, are being used in the project that we're doing. Uh, yeah, so all of this very good inputs, as I said, not just to a specific project, but institutions, PPP center, local governments, and into the formal planning programming that we do, not just individual, it's a collective set of regulatory bodies, DNR, our office, the PPP center, and of course, the recipient contracting entities for PPPs, local governments, and um, corporations like Clark here. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Deputy E.D. Elijah. Yeah, I think um, I'm conscious of the time. So actually, we invited the project officers of the uh, Philippine projects as well. So if, uh, I mean, any of our project officers um, have any uh, questions and comments, please uh, provide yeah, your inputs. <laughs> okay, if not, you know, um, um, we are fully aware that um, uh, our uh, UCCLTF and URTF team, because we are closing UCCLTF soon, and then uh, we initiated the, the second phase of the UCCLTF, which is URTF. And uh, I understand that uh, some of our project officers and colleagues are in discussion with uh, you for the uh, future program. Uh, for PPP Center and New Clark City, things like that. So definitely we wish you to uh, collaborate further with you through the technical assistance as well as the, the bankable project as well. So many of you already covered the, the second question because we already shared the... the <laughs> so is there, I mean, for quickly, I mean, one minute per panel, it will be really good if you can uh, elaborate uh, some suggestions or uh, consideration for us to uh, think about for the collaboration. Director Elinita, please. Yeah. I think it will be good to continue to highlight the need to have the proper institutional arrangements to follow through results from the first project. And this means institutional arrangements both at the uh, provincial governments, the city governments, with the national government, with the national government agencies, and particularly with the allied sectors of uh, civil society, private sector, academe, and the like. Uh, and therefore, I think in, in this regard, capacity building will be an area of uh, continuing need uh, to be able to uh, see through uh, even phase implementation from the first project, as you said, by the UCCTRVF. Uh, I, I would think that there's also need to uh, go to some of the localized concerns uh, like uh, some infrastructure projects that they need further uh, looking into, uh, uh, building into the nature-based solutions aspect of it. I think these would be areas of needing uh, future assistance. Thank you, Director Linita. And uh, Engineer Pamela, please. Um, Uh, as to the challenges, um, there were several noted during the implementations, a lot actually, but there are three major. Um, one is acquiring valid proof of land ownership. No, we have a difficulty in acquiring the land ownership but because it should be donated to the uh, government. Another was um, to embed uh, the climate change and disaster design concept. So we have to change the design, the structural design. And we have conducted um, geophysical and topo topographic survey as well as a uh, environmental and safeguard assessment before the construction. So um, by the time it is being procured, uh, there is a change, so it, it costs us uh, time, no delay. And then, um, so uh, as well as with the requirements and guidelines um, on construction during, during COVID-19, there was a limited number of contractors during that time. But the way we overcome this is close coordination 
collaboration with the local government unit of Marawi and Lumbayanagi is the key to overcome the challenges. So we have to uh, we have to coordinate with them with the able and good leadership and guidance of the Department of Health. So um, I will not uh, say what are the uh, materials installed. Um, or I will just mention the materials in, installed for the envir environmental sustainability, light colored roofing, roof insulation, and then um, lead lighting fixtures to uh, reduce air conditioning costs and then um, significant decrease in energy consumption. Okay, so um, I would just like to have um, in closing, no? So the Department of Health through its Bureau of International Health Cooperation, uh, which is the uh, project management unit in collaboration with the Office of the Field Implementation, Implementation and Coordinating Team in Visayas and Mindanao, and then the Centers for Health Development, Northern Mindanao. So that answered the question why I was the one presenting. So is the one implementing the, the project. But the rep representative from the Ministry of Health, BARM, we're also engaged in the project implementation to ensure a seamless transition and handover after the completion of the project. So more importantly, the strong and resilient leadership of DOH Under Secretary Dr. Abdullah Dumama Jr. and active collaboration of the different stakeholders, as well as the unwavering support of the EDB and the recipient LGU has been instrumental in the successful implementation of the project. Thank you. Thank you, Engineer Camilla. For uh, PP Kenneth and T D uh, Elijah, thirty second, please. For the yeah, please. Oh, okay. Um, NCC will be the uh, the real the, the real essence of a green, smart, and re resilient city. Would be NCC. We are not just looking for uh, water recycling. We're also looking at district cooling system. We're looking at uh, electric vehicles uh, for a uh, for our BRT. We're also looking at uh, renewable energy, solar, uh, water recycling. We met with Hitachi yesterday, Engineer Fe. So we were introduced with new concept of uh, new water, remix water. So we are really looking into that uh, uh, angle in uh, how to preserve our water system in, in NCC. And my time's up. 20 minutes, I'll try. So the last so far is really a building on planting the seed. It really was just uh, first, first space of many things we intend to do together in the future. Next step, I would say, is to really build from the uh, resilience portfolio of identified 12 um, cities, uh, 12 municipalities, and four uh, metro cities. A lot of projects have been identified there. Next step would be to translate this project into real uh, risk resilience, uh, disaster uh, responsive projects. They're ready, we've identified LGUs have owned them. So next step is to help them do that. Second, I think is to build on the initial collaboration. There was uh, the major lesson that I would say is getting the various agencies to talk together. That was a major challenge, especially local governments, the Mandamus ruling and the full devolution directive, getting all of us to have a common language understanding of what we mean when we say disaster resilience, et cetera, et cetera. Getting that concretized into a program that cuts across agencies, specific projects we can follow through, and some policy and program inputs into the formal planning and programming with the national local government. A lot it looks a lot, but this are already identified focused in terms of the areas of intervention for the next step of UCC RTF. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your contributions and years and years. And we wish you to, uh, we expect to working with you uh, further as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hong Su, for your guidance in this session. And thank you for our uh, panelists. Uh, we're happy to hear that the results you know, of UCCRTF support are actually taking root. And we hope that in the coming years, we will see the impacts. Okay, so moving on from the results emerging from the program, the next session, we'll look at the lessons learned and how these are shaping the Urban Resilience Trust Fund, the successor of UCCRTF, and also how it's expected to contribute to the UK government's wider climate objectives.
The moderator for this session is Ms. Jasmine Bourne, Economic and Climate uh, Counselor for the British Embassy in Manila. So prior to her current position, Ms. Bourne was working for the British High Commission in New Delhi, working as a private secretary for the Chief Operating Officer of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Uh, so Ms. Bourne, I'd like to invite you to come up here. Thank you. Hello, and thank you very much, Vicky. Um, so for the second session, as UCCRTF officially closes in 2023, the session presents the major lessons learned from the programme and can help inform present and future urban development and climate adaptation in, uh, in investments. So I'd like to invite my panellists up. Um, we have Sean on the line, and we have Satoshi and Varinda in the room. So if you come to the stage, that'd be great. Um, so Satoshi Ishii is Director, Strategy and Partnerships, Water and Urban Development Sector Office in the ADB. Varinda is the Senior Consultant and former Principal Urban Development Specialist in the ADB. And Sean is Director's Advisor for the ADB Board of Directors. So I'm conscious, um, Satoshi, you need to um, head off shortly for a very important meeting. So I will start with you. Um, and so just to, to introduce Satoshi. Um, so Satoshi is the Director, Strategy and Partnerships Team, Water and Urban Development Sectors Group at the Asia Development Bank. Previously, he served as ADB's Vietnam Urban Water Sector Focal. He is an environmental engineer and urban sector expert with more than 18 years of experience, including 15 years with development finance institutions. He has designed and managed city water, sanitation, transport, energy and infrastructure projects in Cambodia, Malaysia, People's Republic of China, Thailand and Vietnam. His areas of expertise include infrastructure, finance, climate change mitigation and adaptation and environmental pollution control and management. Prior to joining ADB in 2009, he worked for the Japan International Cooperation Agency, Japan Bank for International Cooperation, the United Nations, and the University of Tokyo. Sorry for the long intro. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is long, yes. <laughs> um, but you, you packed a lot in there. Um, so over to you, Satoshi. It would be great to hear um, from you about how lessons from UCCRTF will inform the URTF and how it will play out in the NOM in the ADB. Which you sure, thank you very much, uh, Jasmine. So first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm, I'm really, really excited first to learn about, you know, the uh, uh, Philippine country colleagues and counterpart, the use of UCCRTF. And then apparently uh, uh, I'm the, uh, um, and with my team, uh, managing the new fund of URTF. Uh, so, you know, we are really keen to further improve and operationalize, you know, and then also have even bigger uh, impact, you know, under the URTF. That's really, and this road show is really, you know, again, uh, bring us together, let's learn and reflect into the future. I think this really set the standard for the other country because of course UCCRTF has several countries that we would like to, you know, have the very similar session with a country team, you know, to talk uh, in depth about how, you know, UCCRTF before and now URTF is going to, you know, the contribute uh, to that. So I understand this session two with uh, uh, Shan and Vilinda is really kind of connecting session one to session three. Uh, so, you know, the session three, uh, you know, John is going to moderate with our country team and then also a sector expert about, you know, more in-depth discussion about, you know, how uh, Philippine uh, programming and portfolio is going to benefit from your so in my uh, part of the uh, uh, to connect this dot, of course, uh, you know, uh, there are several lessons uh, that came out from the uh, UCCRTF. If you may have already seen this lesson learned snapshot, is that one page behind there, there are six lessons uh, that is very, very well articulated, uh, talking about, you know, from asset centric uh, approach to the more upstream, you know, conceptualizing uh, the climate change into the actual project design. And that's really something uh, we would like to, you know, see more. Sometimes, uh, for example, this Clark City project, we happened in, you know, Philippines was really innovative uh, to design and then address 
address at the very upfront of the planning stage, and then that will influence all the downstream, you know, investment. So that's something we would like to continue doing it in URTF, but also further enhance it, uh, you know, the approach because we have learned lessons. I also, you know, very happy to hear the uh, session one uh, feedback about this, you know, the. Uh, uh, proper institutional arrangement, you know, talking about more engagement, more upfront dialogue with the government, you know, that's really uh, needed to make that things happen. And again, reflecting into the uh, uh, very beginning, you know, the bit, uh, country, our country director's point on uh, ADB going into the climate bank. And this is something that we really would like to have. It's not only counting the climate finance, but in terms of the benefit, you know, we would like to make our project tweaking more uh, towards the uh, uh, climate change angle. And um, uh, of course, uh, under uh, ADV is going under new operating model. And then uh, not only we are asking government to, you know, do more and then change, but of course, ADB need to change as well. So, you know, under this new operating model, we are now uh, bringing our you know, trust fund management team sit right next to our next to our operations team, and then the, uh, we are also reporting to the same you know sector senior director. This really brings us uh, more power to work, and then the, uh, looking for the synergy, even optimize our resources as well. So in the past, our structure was you know fund manager was uh, our fund management team was sitting in a different department reporting to the different boss, and the operations department was were reporting to the different regional director general, but now uh, we are actually uh, moving into the sector uh, sector office that you know cutting across all the uh, regions. So of course, you know we expect the Philippine uh, experience to be uh, exported, you know, uh, to the other uh, developing member country, and then of course we as our team need to be uh, we need to catalyze those uh, cross learning. At the same time, you know. That also means that we can bring other country experience into the uh, uh, Philippine, you know, operations and portfolio and programming. And, you know, those kind of maybe uh, uh, institutional, you know, ADB's institutional setup and then also uh, institutional optimization uh, should happen uh, in ADB as well. Uh, before taking this role, I was the uh, uh, sitting in Vietnam, Hanoi for uh, seven years, and I have a heavy user of UCCRTF. I was really benefited, you know, uh, from the project. Of course, there are a lot of difficulties, which I have been hearing, you know, this session one, uh, very common, you know, very common uh, challenges. And then, the, so, you know, one of the things which I also would like to pick up is really that, uh, um, you know, the first session talks about, we are talking about something innovative. We are talking about something climate change adaptation. So when it really comes to the implementation or designing, we actually have a lot of issues at the project level. You know, maybe government uh, standard or engineering standard doesn't allow even to have you know, sometimes such uh, uh, such factors into the design. For example, you have to design bigger drainage for the climate change, but simply government engineering standard doesn't allow to over invest, you know, for those infrastructures. So those are kind of the difficulties that, you know, the, the, the team has been facing. So of course we are nice to be innovate and we are nice to be moving ahead, but sometimes we have to go very fast so that the government system doesn't really follow, you know, our system. Then, you know, we are kind of back working backwards to working on a policy, you know, level in terms of new guidelines, you know, in terms of the new engineering standard. And that's something that we have been, you know, working or learning from UCCRTF. And then we would like to do more in a URTF because as we said that this policy dialogue is very important. And then now I'm very happy that we are working with, you know, FCDO and then, you know, ADB is a multilateral uh, development bank. And then uh, sometimes we found that policy dialogue with the government could be much stronger by the bilateral donors, you know, to be honest. So we have a multilateral development bank who has a lot of stakeholders, you know, board of directors with a different interest. However, working closely and you know strategically working with the bilateral uh, you know support uh, financing supporters or the government in this case for example UK government we may be able to you know leverage or support each other to push some of the agenda so you know this is something maybe we also like to pursue 
how to strategically or take advantage of working, you know, closely with uh, UK government and FCDO to, you know, improve or even enhance our policy dialogue. So apparently there are a lot of lessons. I don't want to go for each one of them. Belinda and Shan is going to further elaborate on that. But then I'd like to, you know, uh, uh, push our team to be, you know, uh, more closer to the client and then closer to the ADB sector team. And then the, uh, we'd like to further have, you know, the better uh, impact and outcome. So I maybe stop here. Thank you very much, Janice. Thank you very much, Satoshi. So uh, we will like, we'll have opportunity for questions and answers at the end, but I will continue with the, the two of, uh, other presentations first of all. Um, so next, I would like to turn to Varinda Sharma. Um, so Varinda is a sustainable development professional with more than 25 years of experience in designing, planning, executing and monitoring programs on climate change, renewable energy, environment, urban development and rural livelihoods. He has worked in India, Kenya and the Philippines and managed projects in the UK, Australia and the People's Republic of China and Nepal. Farinda, over to you. Would you like to, to ask about give me this platform? I would <laughs> happily do that. If that is possible. Just for a presentation, I think that will be uh, OK. Uh, so I think uh, I was trying to, you know, look back at uh, UCCRTF and uh, this 10 years of the program and what are the lessons learned. But the first thing that I noted is that, you know, when we uh, worked in UCCRTF, we had this resilience academies. That's where we brought the uh, project counterparts from the governments and experts to identify opportunities that would be taken up in the cities. And that was done as a part of the resilience academies. And now today, we are moving ahead and culminating into the road shows. So it's a very interesting journey where you start with the initial, let's say, identification of the city and the concept and working with the government. And then you come here and you listen to all the government counterparts uh, mentioning the work that they've done. So, so, it's, so it's an interesting journey. And I hope that this uh, uh, road show concept, you know, this is our first road show. Uh, though we have had about five resilience academies, which is before we start the project, but uh, this is more about culminating it. And we would expect that these road shows continue into the other countries uh, that U URTF and UCCRTF are working on. Now, uh, what are the key achievements of UCCRTF? I think this is a, a bit, you know, repetitive slide, but I just wanted to, uh, because of the uh, people in the audience, uh, just to look at, you know, what are we really uh, delivering in this 10-year, uh, 105 million program? And if you look at the top, the key achievement has been on delivery of resilience benefits to the people. And you can see the direct and indirect impacts there uh, on the people in terms of building resilience. Just to note that, you know, these uh, uh, indicators on reporting climate resilience are coming from the UK International Climate Fund. And every uh, uh, activity that we are doing under UCCRTF reports against these indicators. Uh, how we are going to do it, I think uh, important to understand the ADB project cycle. And uh, this is really important uh, because you have the country partnership strategy where the discussions are happening with the government, the portfolio, the pipeline is identified. Uh, then you go into the loan preparation, and the loan appraisals, and of course, then the implementation and evaluation. And this cycle is taking about eight to 10 years. So something like UCCRTF, which was designed only for five years from FCDO, actually extended to eight to 10 years because we had to match with the ADB project cycle. And the important thing there is that if you have to embed resilience, resilience according to the ADB framework, it's about infrastructure resilience. Of course, ADB does a lot of infrastructure. And so it's the physical resilience, but it's also about the ecological resilience, the nature-based solutions. And then uh, the financial resilience, the instruments that you have beyond the loans in terms of developing financial resilience and finally, the social and institutional, which are critical parts of this. So resilience is multifaceted, uh, 
complex and requires for us to work across the ADB project cycle in this eight to 10 year. And what is what we are talking about is systemic interventions uh, through uh, climate risk informed uh, planning, because planning is an integral part. When do you select the cities? When do you select the sub projects within the cities? That's the loan within the loan. And how do you move ahead in terms of identifying that? Uh, the second is the infrastructure where you know you're actually supporting cyclone shelters uh, you are supporting uh, health centers you just saw in maravi and these are areas which are being supported uh, through that but the innovative approach is how do you use the ucc rtf the fcdo and the other financing partners funds to match it with the adb loans and grants to ensure that innovative approaches on nature positive solutions, flood early warning systems, and the others are integrated into the program. And then of course, this culminates into building knowledge on a regular basis. And uh, a lot has been done within UCCRTF. Uh, I would you know, single out the resilience measurement because before we started each project, we had a baseline, and then we ended up with an end line uh, to do the measurement, and I can see, you know, uh, our colleagues here uh, who helped us uh, design this uh, whole uh, uh, monitoring uh, system. So, so I think this just gives you an idea that you know it's easier to say that you know UCCRT is going to deliver resilience, but how it is going to do it within the time frame that we are talking about, working across scales and sectors is really important in the ADB context. Next, please. So what are the lessons learned in this? Of course, number one, uh, why trust funds itself are providing us that enabling environment, uh, different donors coming together, working with the uh, ADB and within those trust funds, identifying areas like uh, climate resilience. Of course, uh, this has been a, a single most important climate change adaptation, climate resilience uh, from UCCRTF and, and looking for that opportunities as ADB aspires to become the Asia Pacific Climate Bank and also tries to increase the amount of climate finance that it is reporting. And that's where the UCCRTF supports comes in. How do we shape projects? You know, informing, shaping projects have already been identified and there is some work that needs to be done before the identification of the projects. NCC is a good example where, you know, uh, the NCC, they had already gone ahead and done the master plan. I think by virtue of the OPP, which is the uh, Office of Private and Partnerships in ADB, we were asked as an urban sector to review the master plan. So that was our entry point and opportunity of getting in, not otherwise. So, so that's why I think the second point is important. How do you get in? What entry points do you find? How do you shape those projects in form? And you know that small piece of uh, financing that we provided to the new Clark City, uh, led to the review of the master plan, led to savings in terms of nature positive solutions that you could see. And I know that John visited some of these areas and we were, you know, assisted in that the river park and how. But then the water resources study that was done in New Clark City. What is going to happen in terms of sustainability of water resources in New Clark City as a longer term? And then finally, the biodiversity landscape study. And then the work that was done on mobility. So five areas that were identified by this interaction with NCC and the BCDA, uh, which were really important. So this just illustrates how we shape and inform projects and getting that initial entry point is really important for us. Uh, building climate change resilience. Of course, uh, we already have this tool, SPADE, which is a spatial data analysis explorer. And this is a GIS tool in within ADB. And uh, now it's good to note that uh, the ITD, the IT department in ADB is uh, taking up this whole tool so that it is available to project officers to identify. Number one, when you say climate resilience, what does it mean? Where do you cite the project? How do you locate the project? How do you construct the project? How do you deliver the project and how do you monitor the project? And you have to be there in all these five areas if you have to deliver the resilience dividends or the benefits. Uh, and then upstream work on climate change resilience is important. I think that's the whole idea of actually 
uh, being in the readiness mode and trying to ensure that even before the project is identified by our counterparts like Ricard, uh, the project officer here, Elaine here, uh, we can actually in inbuilt uh, the UCCRT of resilience com uh, uh, component within that. And finally, community-led participatory approaches. Now, of course, ADB does a lot of community-led projects, but what is the additional benefit that UCCRTF is providing? It's around ac accountability, transparency, and building empowerment of communities. So it's not just simple participation, it's moving a step beyond that. And that's, I think, the lessons that we have learned, which we are picking up from UCCRTF and hope to implement it in the second phase, uh, URTF. Uh, ne uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide is really important, and I want to, you know, bring the attention of our uh, UK embassy counterparts, Charlotte, John, and others. You know, you are seeing this roadshow where three constituencies are coming together. One, of course, is the uh, UK uh, embassy, uh, people who have been working on this, uh, supporting us, which is right from the ambassador the climate change attache, uh, the prosperity fund cities, Karen, Cherry, uh, Jackus and others have been working with us very closely. So these are the people who are actually making that interface on the ADB side. Uh, but another example is the uh, DNR work. How did it come about? Uh, the ambassador, the, the uh, UK country post here produces a country business plan. And I was inputting into that country business plan because of being virtual within the ADB setup. And one of the things that was identified by the DNR was supporting this component on a resiliency roadmap for uh, you know, 13 provinces and urban centers. And we already had a TA on the PPP center, so we matched the two things. So it doesn't happen automatically. It's important to understand that you know it was a priority identified by the DNR department to the ambassador, UK ambassador, and somehow it clicked because the PPP center was willing to do this study and there was a 3 million TA sitting there from UCCRTF. And that's how the matching happened. And I think we can really build on that uh, component. So, so I talked about the first constituency, which is the UK embassy and uh, the uh, people who are uh, you know working on that. The second constituency is the country uh, uh, director and the resident mission. Now, by virtue of uh, being here in the Philippines, the Philippine country office, uh, the project officers are here, and uh, we have worked very closely with uh, the country director, of course, Kelly Bird then, but now Pavit has come in, and we would certainly want this to be scaled up. Uh, discussions with Elaine, Picard, Kathy, Christina and others on these programs was really critical. So unless you match these constituencies and the entry points, it doesn't automatically happen. I just wanted to, you know, recognize this effort that was done by the UCCRTF to build in this component. Uh, and on the on the third side, I think uh, the support that we get from uh, Satoshi, Honsu, and others in the urban sector in ADB and uh, the work that has been done by Joy and Raymond on most of the uh, portfolio uh, with the uh, support from uh, Sean, John and others, I think has been critical in this. So I think what I'm trying to emphasize is that, you know, these constituencies are already doing a lot of work. Some of it is about building synergy. The others are about avoiding duplication. And we can build synergy if we start talking to our counterparts on a regular basis. And perhaps this roadshow is the first roadshow which is bringing these three constituencies together, where we are sharing, you know, the feedback that was uh, from the government, the ADB resident missions, and the FCDO. And I hope that you know we will be doing this uh, uh, more of this uh, as we move ahead uh, in this. Uh, so, so I hope that this slide illustrates some of this work. I, I mentioned the PPP center, uh, but this slide also includes something that is just being cooked up, uh, a new project in Nusantra city. A lot of lessons from the work that we did on NCC and uh, that could be you know, used for this greenfield city that is being developed in Indonesia. And this is just being discussed. Again, there's a parallel dialogue happening with the UK embassy in Indonesia, plus uh, the ADB team uh, working on this in Indonesia, 
and of course the UCCRTF team who is actually working on that. Uh, next, please. That uh, itself, in in fact, it's my last slide. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, many times the messages that are coming to us from the uh, UK FCDO are about joined up working. But then there is a requirement for joined up working within the various UK country offices and the various, you know, components within that, even before we start working closely with what ADB and the governments are doing. And uh, this illustrates that if you have the initial uh, work around identifying the constituencies, the entry points for these projects, you can move to the next stage, what we call joint programming. And uh, again, to Charlotte and John, I just wanted to mention that, you know, uh, a lot of effort has gone into the PPP Center and DNR work, uh, uh, the work that was done by uh, OPP in ADB and the NCC. And this is something that, uh, you know, the joint programming is very difficult uh, because it also involves a lot of transaction cost, uh, both on the ADB side, uh, the UK embassy side. So perhaps uh, in our road shows and in working uh, with the other UK country offices, that's the aspiration of uh, under URTF. We can be modest in our approach. Uh, what we would like is information sharing should be there, building synergy should be there, and avoiding duplication with the three things which are essential ingredients if, before we can work together on such road shows and joint working. Whether we move to joint programming or not means you have to identify the right vehicle within the ADB and the UCCRTF or the URTF and within the government to do that. And that, you know, is, is always a, a challenge on how we can do this. Uh, this uh, uh, with uh, our expansion now moving from about eight countries uh, to uh, almost 13 countries with a big footprint that URTF has on the Pacific. I think this is going to become more challenging. Overall, what I would say is that, you know, our Philippine portfolio from UCCRTF is about 11 million portfolio and eight core projects. And these projects spread from PPP Center, uh, the Marawi work that was done on health and water resources, the community-led uh, projects, the Department of Health, uh, Philippine uh, 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 Green Health Action Plan, uh, the Sustainable Tourism Project, the Baguio Flood Early Warning System, uh, the NCC work, of course, has been our flagship, uh, and the work with the, uh, just to inform you that 10 e-boards have also been provided to Philippines under the e-vehicles component of UCCRTF, working with the transport side. So, so if you look at the portfolio, 11 million, eight projects, over a span of this, covering a large remit of things, which are, you know, of course, some standalone TAs, but then others are very closely linked to the loans uh, and the ADB investment projects that are already happening. So I, I need to acknowledge today that uh, the effort that has been put in by the ADB project officers and the country representatives, the, the, the country uh, uh, staff who has actually come in here and the UK embassy is really critical in shaping this. And I hope we can build this concept of uh, uh, the road shows. I think you can see these uh, standees behind where some of the uh, successful projects have already been illustrated. Uh, I think today is the Philippines, focus is the Philippines. So if we can, you know, really replicate uh, and build this partnership in the other uh, programs under URTF, that will be a great effort. So thank you very much, and uh, sorry I've taken your stage as well as your <laughs> as well. Please, you can come back and take thank back you. your speech. Thank you very much, Miranda. <laughs> so now I'd like to turn to Sean. Um, so Sean Mitra is the director's advisor and the UK's representative on the ADB board of directors. He has over 25 years of experience working on international development, including leadership, economic advisory and climate change roles within the UK's Department of International Development and now the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. He has worked in London, China, India, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Thailand and of course now the Philippines. Sean, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me all right? Excellent, yes, loud and clear. 
Thank you very much, um, Jasmine, uh, and good to see everyone on screen. I, I found it particularly interesting to hear the presentations um, from the, the the project counterparts in the Philippines. Um, uh, so thank you very much for that. I, I you know, in my in engagement with with UCCRTF, I haven't often had that opportunity to really get the um, perspectives in in detail on specific activities. So that really brings it to life. Um, but as um, others have said, I, I, I have been involved in this is, I, I think, probably what I want to, to focus my remarks on. Um, my perspective, having been vo involved at the beginning of the uh, design and negotiation of UCCRTF with ADB, which is now going back um, at least 11 years now. And I, 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 I can still remember clearly the vision that we were setting out for UCCRTF between ourselves, um, the Rockefeller, and the Rockefeller Foundation, um, Swiss uh, SECO, and the senior management of uh, ADB. And um, I think it was clearly seen then, and I remember the then managing director general, Rajat Nag, saying, you know, we want this to be um, something which will really help us do new things and change the way that we do urban programming to put resilience at the heart of that. So he saw it as a as a way of driving innovation and enabling the ADB along with its partners to introduce new ways of working, not business as usual. Um, so I think we saw it very much not as a trust fund that is just there to provide generic funding for general funding for capacity building or project preparation, as important as those things are, but really enabling new ways of working to be introduced. Um, so that that was the first thing. Um, the second thing I think we the part of the vision that we had was this is very much not about just project level impacts, but it's about strategic, um, very much about uh, strategic uh, impacts. Um, and that means one thing it means is this is not about climate proofing investments. It's not about protecting investments from the impacts of climate change. It's about helping and working with partners to identify, design and then finance the highest priority investments which will maximize the benefits for the widest population in the city and 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 help actually boost the resilience of uh, the city and it and particularly it's its most vulnerable communities. Um, when I talk about strategic impact, it also means about it means uh, looking at impacts on policy uh, planning, not just on individual projects. So um, those again, that was part of the vision we had. A third very much objective was about mobilizing finance at scale. Uh, so through using this technical assistance to really then unlock larger scale financing behind resilience, and that's frankly, is one of the reasons we chose to work with the ADB on this partnership, because uh, an institution like ADB is very well placed to do that through its own uh, lending pipelines and, and its financing partnerships. <clears throat> the final thing I would say is that uh, I think certainly the vision that we had, and I think it was shared by the managing director general at the time, uh, was that the ultimately we would look at the success of UCCRTF, not just in terms of the impacts from the projects that are funded out of the trust fund itself, but how that learning actually then influences and helps ADB to change its overall approach to urban programming across the board. And I think that was something that was shared by certainly a small group of people within ADB. Um, so that, I just wanted to bring that out in terms of the, the vision that we had, which I think was shared um, by a number of partners and at high levels in ADB. Um, I, I, perhaps I would say a little, uh, a few words about the theory of change. Um, sorry to use that jargon, but how we envisage the, um, the design of UCCRTF. And it was really, it was standing on three legs, which were all I think we saw as equally important. One was planning. Uh, the second was investments, financing investments, and the third was knowledge. So I think we certainly saw the planning as I 
explained earlier as being key to this. It's not just about um, retrofitting or climate proofing investments. It's really about working with partners to do the kind of inclusive, um, uh, comprehensive, integrated, bottom up planning uh, that's required, which will help to identify what are the what are the resilience issues, the vulnerabilities, uh, what are the assets and the resources that that cities have, and therefore what should be the priorities, and that would then lead to a pipeline of investments, which might look quite different from the investments that are already there. And it's not also just about infrastructure investments; it's about softer interventions such as regulatory change changes in enabling environment, the kind of very important bureaucratic issues and impediments which um, Satoshi referred to earlier. Uh, and then knowledge is a very, very important part of this because I think there was a recognition this is about innovation. So we need to be able to really capture the lessons from that innovation and rigorously um, document and then uh, put resources into disseminating that. So. I think we we allocated, we set aside 10% of the budget for uh, a dedicated knowledge function. Um, so at the end of UCCRTF now, we're coming to the end of UCCRTF phase one. Um, where have we got to and why did we decide to then invest in a, a second phase, the URTF? I, I would say that um, probably following, it's fair to say, a slow start for the reasons that I think Verinda's talked about. I think we all underestimated the time it took to move from project identification through the project cycle. But we reached a, a stage where we had a very strong um, uh, a basis for learning lessons, uh, uh, quite a large portfolio of ongoing actions. Um, and I think we had it, we had generated enough positive evidence of the proof of concept. And if you see UCCRTF as really a to testing a concept. I think we had a felt we had enough positive evidence um, of the concept to justify a further investment. And this came through numerous examples of strategic or innovative projects, and a number of them have been uh, have been referred to, and they fall into different areas: upstream integrated planning, the geospatial planning tool SPADE, which I I felt was a, we all felt was a very powerful um, uh, innovation that was uh, promoted by uh, by UCCRTF. Community based approaches. I think that was genuinely quite novel for ADB to be working with civil society and having a much more community led approach to resilience work and nature based solutions, certainly. And I mean, I, we, I had the pleasure of visiting New Clark City myself a few years ago, just after the river study was had been done. So it's very interesting to hear from the vice president of BCDA and hear about the way that's now being implemented. Um, so we, we felt there's, there's been a strong, uh, a strong uh, body of work that's being developed by UCCRTF, but certainly not the end of the journey. As uh, Pavit Ramachandran referred to, this is a journey earlier. Um, that is certainly the case, and I think there's still a lot to do. So the design of URTF is really has it's really been designed to sharpen the focus on some of these issues which really need continued attention and emphasis. One of those is on uh, in strengthening the incentives for greater upstream engagement at the strategic and planning level, continuing to focus on the areas where there's a real there's really a need for more innovation, lesson learning areas like um, nature based solutions. For example, disaster risk financing. Um, so, where are the areas where we really need to ensure there's sufficient investment to then uh, be able to get a good body of evidence for replication and knowledge? Um, we want to continue to incentivize genuinely, cat genuinely catalytic projects uh, and policy impact, both within ADB and in the developing member countries. So, I feel that's perhaps something that uh, needs more attention. I think there's a good, there's many good examples. It's not clear to me how far those have been taken into dialogue with developing member countries to help uh, to help inform their wider urban planning frameworks. 
uh, and uh, enabling policies. I'd let me just close with a couple of observations that I think as we move from UCR, UCCRTF into URTF, this uh, there could not be a better time, actually, a more opportune time to be doing this. ADB is now, as others have referred to, is now positioning itself as the climate bank for Asia Pacific. Um, it has set out a, an ambition, 100 billion climate, uh, 100 billion dollar climate finance ambition, and it is just uh, in the process of finalizing a new climate change action plan, which I think is quite a powerful statement of how ADB intends to use that climate finance to really maximize impact in the most strategic ways. And it talks about working on upstream, midstream and downstream levels, very well aligned with the vision that UCCRTF and URTF have. So I think um, the institutional environment in ADB is very, very well placed now for building on what we've done to date uh, and as we move forward into URTF. Um, I do think we will need to have a continued emphasis on rigorous learning and knowledge dissemination, events like this, but many more of them and across the region more widely. Um, and I would also say, and this is something that again is highlighted in the Climate Change Action Plan, the value of partnerships. Uh, let me just close with this perhaps, that I think um, UCCRTF, I would acknowledge the partnership of Swiss SECO and um, Rockefeller Foundation. Rockefeller Foundation, even though their financial contribution was relatively small, it was, I mean, I think it was what was much more important was the ideas they brought to the table, which helped to shape the design and a lot of the ideas. Um, and the Resilience Academies, which Brinda referred to, I think were an innovation of, of Rockefeller Foundation. So the more partners we have, the more ideas and inputs we get uh, to making a success of the whole venture. And I would say the same would apply to the Community Resilience Partnership Programme, which is a new ADB trust fund, which in some ways was informed by the community-based work under UCCRTF. And we have, again, a range of partners in that, including some civil society organisations, which I think is quite a, an interesting departure for ADB. So I, I would really emphasise that I think we would see multi-partner multi funds like this as having a lot to offer compared with perhaps uh, single uh, single partner funds. Um, so let me perhaps end there and uh, hand back to you, uh, Jasmine. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Sean. Um, that was really informative. So now I'm going to open the floor for questions. We have about five minutes uh, or minus five minutes. Um, so it'd be great to have any questions from the room or online um, that you have for Sean or Verinda. Yes, lady over there. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sharon Taylor. I'm from one of the um, Philippine country implementers of the UCCRTF program, the Philippine Rural Reconstruction Movement. We worked on the community-led programs in the Philippines with the ADB, the UCCRTF and Oxfam. Um, so thank you for the opportunity for that. It's more of a comment I have is that the recognition, I think, from the presentations today, the coordination, the partnerships, and the ability to really bring out what the community needs from the ground into resilience programming, um, which I think the UCCRTF through its TA for the community-led projects really achieved in this. So thank you for that opportunity. I would really hope as well to see more of this continuing as well in your next steps forward for the funding allocations for the UCCRTF. I think there's been a large impact on the ground. We're still following this up. Obviously, the programme we're in charge of, it was too soon to measure the impact, but we're still doing monitoring of the CLPs on the ground to follow through the actual benefits it's had with this community-led approach. So thank you, and we hope to see more of it in the future. Thank you. That's great. Uh, thank you very much, Sean. Uh, any more questions from the room or online? If you raise your hand online and we can turn to you. Uh, great, over there. 
Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Maylene Rivera. I'm from the Environmental Land Use and Urban Planning and Development Bureau of the Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development. It's not um, a question, but more of a um, comment. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, um, you know, um, congratulate uh, ADB and the rest of the partners now for this uh, good project, very good project. It is very much in line with um, what the department also is doing. Um, we have several initiatives on uh, urban resilience as well. Um, we have a lot of um, ongoing projects to mainstream um, risk resilience in land use planning um, in urban designs. No, and uh, we're hope we just I just wanted to say that we wanted to um, we're very much open to more to collaborations with uh, the agencies present here. No, um, for I hope there will be more projects like this. No, um, we have a lot. We have um, several initiatives. I think um, can be. Um, enriched by collaborations with um, all the stakeholders present um, this, in this room. Um, yeah, so we are a new we are a new agency. Basically, we are four years old, no. But uh, um, this is the first time that um, we are um, for the longest time. I, I've been with the housing sector, but the focus has always been housing. This is the first time that there's an agency that's focused on urban development, and we want, really wanted to ensure that resilience. Um, is um, incorporated in um, not only in housing but in building human settlements. You know, we are up, we're uh, looking into a human settlements approach now, and I think it's very important that um, um, you know all these efforts are integrated. You no, know? what you're doing is also integrated with what we are advocating um, in the land use and urban designs of local government units. Um, yeah, so I hope um, that should there be um, an expansion or, uh, of this pro of this program or similar programs, um, the, the Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development will be involved, especially now that um, we have the flagship program of government on Tambansang uh, Kabahay para sa Filipino program, which just not which just not only targets housing but also building new towns. You, there we have a township. We plan to build township projects all over the country, and we hope that uh, all the stakeholders here will be our partners as well. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. And I think there was one more question at the back. Thank you so much. I have a one uh, simple question, but before that, I would like to uh, you know convey really sincere thanks, sincere and you know deep uh, thanks and appreciation appreciation to Virinda and uh, Shan. So, in fact, I was a part of the secretariat. Uh, now I'm working, you know, at ADB as a climate change specialist. So, uh, I really, we really think that without, you know, the huge and the instrumental, you know, contribution from Virinda and the Shan, you know, we would not able to see this URTF as a, you know, uh, second phase. So my question is, uh, in relation to this session two, lessons learned. Lessons learned come from, you know, achievement and also the challenges. So you both very much highlighted achievement and the very positive side. So we want to hear your candid, you know, the experience about the challenges. So that's it, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no more questions in the room or online, I will turn to uh, Verinda and Sham. What were the challenges? Um, Verinda, do you want to go first? Yes, I can go first and then Sean can come in. Uh, no, I think, uh, uh, thanks, Okchu. I think we missed that uh, slide. Perhaps we could have added that. Uh, that was shown yesterday. In fact, I call them my, uh, not challenges, my failures. And uh, because of uh, this 10 year journey, I think all successes and failures are attributed to uh, UCCRTF uh, team, which you were a part of, and that includes me also. Uh, the important thing that we uh, perhaps uh, learned, and I would, you know, single out uh, one or two things. One is the community-led projects, and this also relates to the uh, the uh, mention that was made 
uh, about the success of the community-led projects. It's still very difficult to operationalize this community-led approach, uh, the approach that we are talking about beyond participation in the ADB context. Uh, I keep on saying that, you know, uh, the largest contract that uh, UCCRTF did in ADB uh, for a civil society organization that was Oxfam for the community-led projects. So it's it's something that was completely new. As Sean mentioned, it's a trend setting. And uh, within the next phase of the URTF, this is also included. So I would put that at the top. Second is our failure to get clear private sector pipeline. And uh, one of that we want to mention is uh, the catalytic fund. The idea was that uh, we were supported under the business case uh, for the project, which allowed a catalytic fund, but the ADB instruments didn't allow us to bring out or develop a catalytic fund for microfinance for rehabilitating and retrofitting uh, flood prone housing. Uh, and I, I know that housing was also mentioned as the as the second area. Uh, the, 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 so, so, so there are countless failures that we have had, which we are trying to build in and ensure. Uh, one of the things that I would again, and now the responsibility lies with you, uh, how do we factor in uh, the climate projections and ensure that these climate projections are also factored in the ADB cost benefit analysis? You need to go beyond the EIRs, and that's the only way that will allow to factor longer term adaptation into the ADB economic valuation. So all loans have economic valuation, but currently uh, the flood early warning systems, reducing impact of climate, uh, climate change adaptation, nature positive solutions, you can talk about air quality management, another uh, big you know, gap area, these are still not factored in the ADB cost benefit analysis. And if ADB has to deliver on the Asia Pacific Climate Bank, as well as deliver on the 1 billion, uh, uh, the 100 billion climate finance, then uh, getting the economics of this right is there. And my final point is that, you know, what I would like to see as success of UCCRTF is when the BCDA, or the Department of uh, DNR, for example, goes back to the Philippine government and say that we have actually done this pilot. We would like you to actually develop the next loan on that. And we have been doing that in Bangladesh. It has been successful. So if the government and the people constituencies are ultimately impressing upon their own governments to ensure that their loans are integrating climate resilience, that's the success factor we want to see. It's a, it's a full circle where they, you know, the governments impress upon uh, ADB to ensure this happening. And if that happens, that would be the larger influencing change and policy change that Sean mentioned. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Renda. Uh, Sean, over to you. Thanks, uh, and I'm glad you asked Verinda to go first because uh, it means I um, he's done a lot of the work for me. But I, I would. I was certainly going to refl uh, to um, talk about private sector because I think that's one of the areas where uh, AD, um, so UCCRTF has found it more difficult to get really uh, meaningful, um, uh, impactful uh, projects going. So I, I think it's partly because of the inherent greater difficulty. I think when you talk about resilience and adaptation investments um, to uh, demonstrate uh, the um, returns, financial returns, and structure these. Um, so I think that's something that will need more uh, more attention and, and probably in UCRTF, probably worth revisiting the balance and how much emphasis needs to go on that as opposed to uh, working with on the planning and public infrastructure and policy side. Um, second thing, uh, I, as I referred to earlier, um, I, I think one area where I felt I would have liked to see more progress and I'm not sure whether this is how much of this is due to the the teams within ADB that both the UCCRTF secretariat and the regional departments which are using the fund um, whether it's really down to them more or but it's about moving from 
uh, these good examples to actually um, using this to inform what's being done on a wider level by the developing member country governments. So in terms of their planning and policy frameworks for urbanization, um, for climate change adaptation, their national adaptation plans. As Verinda said, one route, of, route towards that perhaps is, is when will we see them actually that influencing the way that the demands that they make on the next generation of loans from ADB, but it's beyond I think ADB's pipeline. Maybe this is very amb ambitious, but I think it's a level of ambition that UCRTF can reasonably have is um, that impact on the wider policy frameworks in the countries. And I'm not sure we've quite got to that stage yet. It is it is a journey, as I said. The, maybe the final area I, I would say is um, I still think there's more work to be done on getting the flow from planning, supporting integrated planning to the investment pipeline. AD, uh, the UCRTF has done a lot of good work on planning. It's done a lot of good work on investments. It's not necessarily has been a, a linear progression from planning to the investments. So um, I think moving more towards that direction where we're not just working on innovative investments, but influencing and helping to finance the right kind of priority investments that emerge from a planning process. So working with partners from start to finish, from the planning stage through investments, financing to completion, that will take a longer time. Um, so maybe there's some more that can be done on that. Let, let me stop there. Great, thank you very much, Sean. Um, we're out of time for questions, um, so I'll just wrap up, but I would like to start by thanking um, Sean and Verinda for their really great input to this session. Um, I mean, to wrap up, I, I think I will borrow what Verinda said about um, the the lessons around building synergies, avoiding duplication and information sharing. I think that building synergies, um, things like the, the new operating model in the ADB is that opportunity to continue and increase those synergies that we're seeing. Um, avoiding duplication through working closely with the country offices um, of the SUDO. It's great to hear that that is happening and, and I'm sure will continue. And then on information sharing, um, I think the fact that URTF will do more to work with governments on the policy side so that this great innovation that is happening, we can support governments to keep up with the pace of that um, and, and share that knowledge on what's being learned. I think that it's these three areas um, that we'll see programs like the URTF be catalytic, catalytic um, and unlock further funding. Um, but I would close by saying that I think also Sean's um, point on the, the value of partnerships that underpins all this um, and knowing that through the URTF, um, these partnerships will continue, will grow um, and, and really will be the foundation of the URTF. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you to my speakers, Sean and Verinda. Thank you very much, um, Jasmine, for moderating this session, and also uh, Virinder, Satoshi, and Sean for sharing your ideas. So that's 10, min 10 years of implementation summarized in 30 minutes. You saw the birth pains, implementation challenges, and how we're going to take it forward. So thank you for that. Um, so we will take a short coffee break to give you a chance to stretch your legs and get some coffee. We, if As you came in, you must have seen the posters lined up in front. So these are the posters featuring the projects of UCCRTF. So as you stand up to get your coffee, I'd like to invite you to you know, take a walk around and, and look at these posters. Our colleagues from UCCRTF will be around to, to answer some of your any questions you may have. And we will reconvene in about at, at 11.30. Okay, thank you.
What? 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 What?
And we please had a chance to get their coffee. I'd like to invite you all to come back here and take your seats. So thank you very much for staying on with us. This is our final session. Um, so this last session on key takeaways and ways forward will be moderated by John. So please allow me to introduce him. Hold on. All right, so this final session will be moderated by John. He's the head of the Climate Change and Environment in the Pacific Regional Department, and he's also the Senior Climate and Environment Advisor for the British High Commission for FCDO. He's had 35 years of program and personal management experience in the private and public sectors, including more than 20 years of catalyzing and implementing climate and environmental policies, programs, and projects, predominantly in Africa and Asia, across all sectors of international development and on poverty reduction. So, John, please take the stage. Thank you, Vicky. Let me ask my four panelists to come up, please. Um, we've got Alan Morell, who is the Country Operations Director, or sorry, the Country Operations Head in the Philippines Country Office of the Asian Development Bank. Alan, do you want to take the stage? We have um, Nidhi Krishnamagado, who's the Senior Infrastructure Specialist, Innovation and Green Finance, uh, the Green Finance Hub of the ADB, the Southeast Asia Regional Department. Naida, please. Oh, she's just. OK, she'll come up in a second. We have Chow Tu, Urban Development Specialist. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. It's um, Urban Development Specialist in the Water and Urban Development Sector Office. And we have Ricard Elving, who's the Principal Social Sector Specialist in the Human and Social Development Sector Office of the ADB. So we have a broad spread of technical and, and geographic expertise. Um, so yeah, so I'm I'm John Warburton. I'm the the head of um, climate and environment in FCDO's Indo-Pacific Regional Department. Um, the UK FCDO has been the majority funder of both uh, UCCRTF and of the new trust funds, the Urban Resilience Trust Fund. Um, we also we also IPRD Indo-Pacific Regional Department also funds a sister um, trust fund called the Community Resilience Partnership Program that Sean mentioned a little bit earlier, that as the name suggests, focuses on locally led adaptation and um, and community participation. We want to make sure, even though the CRPP is in a different um, part of the bank, we want to make sure that there's a very close collaboration and linkage between the Urban Resilience Trust Fund and the Community Resilience Partnership Program. Because as we heard, there's there's um, a very important dimension of urban resilience is to ensure that um, communities are part of the planning, design and implementation process. 
there was also the question about you know, how, well, firstly, the challenge has been raised. Thank you, Nader. The challenge has been raised about this, this um, you know, urban res development of urban resilience takes a long time. UCCRTF has been running for uh, has been running for ten years. URTF, well, certainly the SCDO is committed to the Urban Resilience Trust Fund for at least eight more years until March two thousand thirty one. So, you know, we're in it for the long game. We recognise um, that these these processes take a long time. I and uh, my my. Um, the, the climate environment team within IPRD. We're we're based in New Delhi. Um, I was interested to hear uh, Ambassador Law Bofi saying that Manila is the most densely populated city. I mean, I have to say, sometimes in uh, that feels the case in New Delhi. Um, sadly, New Delhi, I think, beats Manila for for air pollution problems. But there's one thing that's no doubt that the Philippines, as a country, is, is very vulnerable to. The climate crisis, and I think, again, you know, previous speakers have mentioned the importance for urban resilience of 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 not just looking at historical um, historical events, but but thinking about the future. And I'll just remind you, the UK Met Office and Pegasa, the um, Philippines um, uh, Meteorological Agency, have been working together to to obviously to you know to project what the implications of the climate crisis are for uh, for countries across Asia. For the Philippines, it's it, there's three three basic areas that um, extreme heat and heavy rainfall is going to increase. That sea level is going to continue to rise, and and storm surges are going to increase. And then the third area is that, and this is particularly relevant to the Philippines, that tropical cyclones are likely to increase in severity. The only the only slightly good news is that they're not predicted to increase in frequency. But the severity of cyclones is going to, you know, is going to increase. And obviously, the Philippines is one of the most um, uh, is one of the most it, one of the countries in Asia that is most severely impacted by by typhoons, so, by cyclones. So this is a serious, a serious issue. So with that introduction, let me turn to my to four colleagues from from the Asian Development Bank. Um, I've got four specific questions, but in in the uh, in answering their specific question, I'm sure they'll also say a little bit about their, their sort of reflection on what they've heard um, so far, both from uh, bo both from colleagues and particularly from the government. So can I first ask um, Ricard, according to this time, so Ricard, we've already heard about the Marawi um, post-conflict rehabilitation project. Which is about the construction and upgrading of health facilities. Any reflection on your experience of of implementing this project with the support of UCCR, um, UCCRTF, and what can we do better uh, in terms of um, for the for the Urban Resilience Trust Fund within the human and social development sector in the Philippines and perhaps more widely as well. Okay, thanks uh, for uh, allowing me to be here to share some of the experiences as I start. Um, I wrote down a few points that, um, you know, when you mention Philippines, it's interesting the various type of challenges that we're facing here. I remember the the couple of floodings that we have had. We had Typhoon Yolanda, which was probably the worst typhoon that the planet ever encountered. Um, I myself, I don't live too far away from uh, Tal Lake, which uh, has uh, the beautiful volcano next to it. So I had, I took away three ton of ash from my property at one stage because of the uh, uh, volcano uh, outbreak, and then the floodings that we go through. So it's a, it's a country that is, uh, yeah, it's just full of interesting challenges, if I may say so. Um, and uh, we were uh, able to work with the Department of Health and uh, the Ministry of Health in uh, Muslim uh, Bangasamoro. And, um, uh, you know, we were fortunate to create an alliance of partnerships between the various ministries here and the communities as well, right after the, uh, the conflict, uh, after ISIS had entered Marawi and the government came back and we were asked to work on the reconstruction of Marawi. 
And this particular grant was very, very useful because it uh, not just uh, demonstrated on how you could build a new set of standards from health facilities at uh, uh, City Health Unit and uh, 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 another sort of a unit in uh, Lumbanayaga. And uh, uh, both of them demonstrates on how we can scale up health facilities at that level. You, you would have to appreciate that this is also in a fragile and conflict setting. So being able to reach out with contractors that can operate in these type of settings were also extremely challenging. But along the way here, I think I would have to give credit to Ramon and the team from UCCRTF from the point of view of being flexible with us, uh, mainly because of the situation that I just described. Without the flexibility and understanding in the context that we were operating uh, when we designed the project and when we implemented the project, we would not have been successful to uh, uh, successfully uh, implement the project. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we tried to be transparent and open about the challenges that we were facing. And by doing that upfront, we had a very good conversation with both uh, Ramon and Verinder and uh, other colleagues in the team. And uh, we were just happy that uh, that was uh, a partnership that worked out well. Now, what are we doing to replicate this? Uh, I'm myself now working on uh, a couple of new projects in the GMS in the Greater Mekong subregion. And we are now trying to see on how we can uh, scale up and uh, resilient and green uh, smart uh, health infrastructure development by working with various type of hospitals uh, in and across Laos, Cambodia, um, and possibly other countries as well as we go forward. And lots of the experiences from this particular project will be uh, incorporated and uh, drawn upon uh, as we go forward. And that is uh, everything from the mitigation to the adaptation especially the adaptation, I think we would have to consider going forward. Uh, lastly, let me just finish with one thing that I think is extremely important. The UCCRTF were also instrumental in providing upstream support in preparing the health facilities development plan in Philippines, which is a costed plan that allows the, the um, Department of Health to allocate resources on an annual basis uh, for health facilities. This particular plan has integrated and mainstreamed various type of climate change features. Uh, so with the support from UCCRTF, we were able to uh, smartly incorporate various type of design features on uh, climate change in this long-term strategic plan. So you would have, you could say that you have demonstrated an impact on, on a short term, but also on a longer term. Thank you. Thanks, Ricard. I should have said that uh, there will be the opportunity uh, to ask questions after we've heard from all four panelists. Um, I have to say this, you know, your your project is particularly exciting, drawing these linkages between climate and health. And as you say, sort of looking at both how to um, how to sort of green and climate proof the facility, the hospital facilities and the health facilities, but also looking in the longer term at, at the the impacts that the climate crisis is going to have on on the health sector overall. I think it's really, really great that you're drawing those links. Maybe just one last piece. So together with the Department of Health, my colleagues that are here, and the Ministry of Health in uh, Bangasomoro, we are also having a technical assistance in the pipeline to see on how we can further assist the Bangasomoro region to do health infrastructure assessment and if we're able to materialize that particular technical assistance, it means that that region would be in a, in a position to scale up a, a greener and more resilient approach to health facilities in the health sector. So uh, I think the knock-on effect on these two health facilities could have a much more significant impact than we perhaps anticipated from the beginning. Sure. Thank you. Sure, thank you. And one thing I can promise you is a lot of us will be looking um, with a lot of interest at this project and we'll be wanting to see how we can use the lessons that that you have, you know, that you will learn um, in in other countries as well as in the Philippines. 
Thanks. That's a great intro, um, sort of segue into Naida, who has been working um, uh, through her department with the Philippine government and the British Embassy in drafting and implementing the Philippine National Adaptation Plan or, or NAPA. What kind of support would you like to see from URTF going forward, both in terms of planning and implementation of the of the NAP, the National Adaptation Plan? And also, what do you think, I mean, what's the role of the local community and how can we ensure that that role is fully um, is fully developed? Thanks very much, John. Um, so I think maybe I'd like to touch on the what first and then the how. So the what, uh, I mean, going to your point about uh, your question relating specifically to the National Adaptation Plan there, the policy framework in the Philippines on climate change is very well developed and mature, has been around, you know, established one of the earliest in the region, you know, a climate change act and climate change policy framework. The challenges has been around, and many of you in this room know it better than me, around implementation about in, in terms of turning climate ambition into sectoral plans, sectoral outcomes. A lot of the examples we heard about today is, is, uh, is excellent practice. Uh, the question is the level of scale and how, how it can become mainstream and normalized and not an individual best case scenario. And I think that's been the greatest challenge on climate policy uh, in the in the Philippines. So in the last two years, the government has uh, ramped up a year and a half, really ramped up its action in two areas. One is how to concretely implement the nationally determined contribution through an implementation plan and actually putting that on paper. First time, some actual concrete action around how that 75% target that we're all uh, you know very curious about is actually going to be implemented. And the second is a national adaptation plan. And the two things are very closely related, but quite different and level of challenges is hugely different. So the National Adaptation Plan has been built by the government over the last couple of years, and I think with extensive support from FCDO this year, they've really uh, pulled it together. And at COP next two weeks' time, we will be talking about both the NDCIP and the and the NAP uh, and presenting it to a global audience. So that's really exciting. The NAP sets out multiple um, areas that the Philippines needs to adapt to climate change, being the you know the world's highest at risk for disasters in the last 20 years. Uh, and the challenge to implementing the NAP uh, and to try and avoid the pitfalls of the of the past will be to convert broad uh, areas of support, like we need to make sure all infrastructure is climate resilient, into sectoral priorities driven by DPWH, DOTR, DOH, DSWD, et cetera. That's going to be the real challenge, taking what's in the vision of the NAP or the areas identified in the NAP and turning it into what is important for Secretary DOTR, Secretary DPW, et cetera, and really entrenching it. That piece is going to be critical. And for me, that, that, that's, uh, that means turning some of the actions developed and looked at in the NAP, which is based on the science based and on very heavy climate analytics into uh, investable projects, but also cross cutting priorities. So we all talk about investable projects all the time, but it, uh, the, the process actually uh, is a little bit top down and bottom up. There is already a flourishing and, and strong infrastructure pipeline in this country that we know that NEDA promotes, uh, that DOF helps to finance. It, this pipeline isn't at all linked to what should be the pipeline for the NAP and the NDCIP. So the first step will really be to bring those two things together. Now, the challenge in the adaptation pipeline, as we heard earlier on today, is really having any of these projects built on an understanding of climate risk. So if we're going to build a highway in Samaragosan, to what extent is the alignment of that highway built on the resiliency roadmaps we've done in those three provinces? That matchmaking exercise is going to be really critical. So going forward for URTF, I would argue that any support in the Philippines needs to be clearly linked to one of the NAP areas and how that is converted into investment with the line ministry involved. That's going to be really critical. Otherwise, we'll continue to have a pipeline of large scale billions of dollars of projects, infrastructure and non-infrastructure that is not linked to the climate resilience context at the scale at which it should be. Some projects are, but not all. That would be the, 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 the I think I've then covered the what, and the in terms of the how, as I mentioned before, clearly linking, using any technical the URTF may provide. And I would argue this is, this is increasingly should be for all ADB support, not just support provided by the URTF. Making sure we are linking our upstream technical assistance to the areas that, you know, bringing the NAP 
which is a you know visionary document and the sector priorities together that needs to be maybe the focus of most of our technical assistance going forward focusing on scale rather than than smaller pieces um, and then the third thing i think really important if we want to implement and turn this into a pipeline that's financed in adb we need to consider what tools we have in place to really finance urban resilience so we we struggle with our financing products at the moment at a sovereign level with urban in this country because we only have the lending support through the the government our pricing is not necessarily affordable by by local governments and so we have a broader challenge that we're trying to solve on on financing local governments it's not just us it's all developing partners so for first thing i think we really need to look at is how can urtf either through its financing products or support address the issue around financing cities in this country that's a broader issue than climate that's an issue for cities and lgus and that issue needs to be resolved before we can really see finance at scale so that's a tall order for urtf in terms of working with uh, in terms of working with local uh, local communities i think we heard some really great examples today of of good practice in that in that area engaging uh, local community organizations ensuring good consultation stakeholder building in building in climate risk really from a local perspective i think making sure that kind of practice is implemented through uh, the programs that the bigger agencies in this country are running will be will be critical and maybe knowledge sharing dissemination some of the lessons learned from urtf will be kind of the way there great there's so much we could ask about the National Adaptation Plan. Maybe just one, because it is really exciting and it is going to be formally launched at COP28, yeah? Not formally uh, launched, but uh, communicated. Communicated, yeah. okay. I mean, it's, again, it's a big question. Private sector, how is that um, How is that integrated into the plan? So that's a really, really good question. I think uh, both for the NDC IP, it's easier for the NDC IP because there are certain areas like energy where you see more private sector. But frankly, for the NAP2, the level of how we engage and bring in private sector really comes back to the sector we're talking about. So if we're talking about large scale flood protection, PPPs, then there's a natural in for private sector. If we're talking about uh, strengthening health facilities, it depends on who owns the health facility. In terms of the overall coordination on the NAP, I think the, there's been a strong multi-stakeholder engagement process on development of the NAP, but implementation, again, is going to come back down to sector level, sector level growth. Yeah, great. Driven. Which I think now is a great input into into Chow, uh, Alan. You'll you'll do the sort of <laughs> overall <laughs> pitch. <laughs> um, Chow, you're you you've got experience of working with several ADB projects and trust funds. Say a bit about how um, water and urban development sector strategy and operations in the Philippines can strongly link with the URTF and um, how it has linked with the UCC RTF and. Knowing that there are, I think there are 40 plus trust funds in in the ADB. Any insights on how trust funds can support the objectives of financing partners and particularly how they can work together? And uh Kingdom has been saying as well. I think the challenge uh level uh plans, uh department ministry level uh plans in the project pipeline, but I think the local uh government levels challenge there is uh, with the decentralization, the Mandana's uh, ruling and so on. The issue is they cannot take on uh, financing from uh, IFIs like ADB, World Bank on their own. Uh, the challenge there is with the repayment and uh, financial uh, sustainability. So we talk about a lot of infrastructure projects, you know, municipal uh, and other uh, urban infra projects, but uh, these are more or less from Department of Transport and um, the Greek culture and so on, but not at the city urban center uh, uh, levels. So when we want to go into cities to invest, whether it's uh, ADB or the private sector, we have to look at the uh, financial robustness of the cities. Uh, so this is probably where uh, most of the trust fund, whether it's uh, a SETF, uh, ASEAN Australia Smart City Trust Fund that we are managing or URTF, we are focusing on the planning and the services area, but not the uh, FM uh, financial management areas. Maybe I think uh, strategically we have to look at, you know, making uh, cities, preparing them for repayment, financial sustainability, working with the private sector, you know, how to uh, address the challenges at the local level. So maybe maybe I would uh, start with that uh, in terms of, you know, where the investment goes into the cities. 
the other one is uh, in terms of uh, municipal infra projects, I would say we've been, I think one point also raised by Sean uh, also is the, we've been focusing on climate proofing uh, so far, but what what we call in ADB terms is a type one uh, project, but we have to look into low carbon, uh, you know, mitigation, you know, type of projects, what we call type 2A, type 2B uh, in, in, in ADB language uh, projects. So we have to strategize our projects, not just climate proofing, but where we have impact on uh, mitigation, not just uh, adaptation. Uh, the, probably the last point from my end uh, is uh, the pipelines, uh, project pipeline, you know, project list at the national level, department level, uh, when we look at to the city level, it's a bit uh, lacking. So we don't have, uh, we have other uh, initiatives in, for example, like in Malaysia, we are working on green city action planning, city level uh, project pipelines, looking at uh, priority resilience infra project or quality infra project. But we are also looking at financing mechanisms where we can have the funding for these projects. So maybe uh, at the city level, when we look at it, how do we fund them? So maybe, you know, sector groups, uh, project teams, uh, looking at the planning side, project side, you know, we have to look into financing mechanism on whether it's a PPP project, private sector lending, or ADB, World Bank, government uh, budget projects. Thank you. Thanks, Shao. Uh, I mean, you've raised a really interesting point that perhaps we haven't touched on that much this morning. I mean, to be honest, city financial management and financial, well, financial management, financial mechanisms, city finances are often a little bit um, chaotic or, you know, and, and this is, uh, I mean, this is as true in the UK as it is in any other country. I mean, um, we've recently had one of our major cities go bankrupt. So, um, yeah, city finances is a challenge. And yeah, I think sometimes PPPs are seen as the solution and they're obviously very important. They're not necessarily going to be a revenue raiser for the city. They, they're going to, they're there to improve a service, not to, you know, not to raise funds per se. But anyway, great, great, um, great point. Uh, I'm aware of time. So we're going to move to Alan. I think it's very appropriate that you're last Alan because you are the, the country operations um, director. So there's a huge um, Philippine uh, borrowing portfolio. I think it's at least um, or more than $8 billion. Um, obviously, it's it's big infrastructure, largely big ticket infrastructure. So bridges and, and roads and, and uh, rail lines and so on. Do you think URTF can support and appropriately incorporate climate resilience uh, into these big ticket items? And and um, so that the proportion of climate finance will significantly increase in the Philippines at both programming and portfolio levels within the ADB. Uh, um, thank, thank you, Alex. So, first, I think it's a nice opportunity to, to thank the UCRTF team for the cooperation with the Philippine country office and what we have been doing over the last, for me, over the last five years, but for Virinder over the last 10 years. Uh, no, that, that, that has been really a, a great program with uh, those eight projects, $11 million, and uh, uh, a lot of lessons learned. And, uh, and uh, in my opinion, first reflection is that I think it should continue those, those type of projects because it's, um, it's uh, generating a lot of, uh, you know, lessons on how to work at the, at the ground level and with the local governments, with the communities and so on. So that's, that's very important for now the operations in the Philippines, as you mentioned, we have a huge, uh, you know, portfolio that is over now 8 billion US dollars. It has been growing up over the last five years, multiplied by four, uh, through the build, 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 and now the build better, more uh, infrastructure program of the, the government. Uh, so we have we have developed really a very strong relationship with the with the government agencies and particularly the, the implementing agencies, Department of Transportation and DPWH. Uh, and I think uh, there, there are two uh, points that were made before that I, I, I think are very important. The first one is about uh, involvement of UCCRTF or 
URTF in the preparation of projects. Uh, and th that relates to, you know, the development of the sector action plan. Uh, so we, we will need to support, you know, our uh, government agencies to prepare those projects and integrate, you know, better defined uh, climate components and, and, and build up on, uh, you know, adaptation components of, uh, for climate change. So, that, that's number one. So involvement of uh, URTF in programming and, and project preparation. And second, the point that uh, Virinder mentioned about um, synergy, creating synergies and, and, and discussions between the different actors, I think it's very important. Um, I was thinking, you know, how to do that uh, under the, the norm in ADB. We, we are establishing now uh, you know, country management teams with focal persons from the different sectors who are meeting regularly to discuss what is, you know, going on and happening in terms of operations in the Philippines. And I think that that could be a good platform to discuss with our URTF uh, colleague, colleagues to uh, to explore, you know, opportunities and, and particularly on big tickets projects where we are all, uh, I would say, learning by doing for the, the, the climate uh, aspects. There are two more things uh, that are important in my, in my opinion. Um, technical assistance. Uh, we have been learning, for example, uh, the work that has been done for New Clark City, the review of the master plan, the opportunities that has emerged from for uh, PPP operations with the private sector, all this. Now we are trying to to do similar things. For example, with the the big ticket project uh, that is Batan Cavite Interleg Interlink Bridge that will cross uh, across Manila Bay. We got uh, a request from the provincial government of uh, Batan to help them develop their master plan for you know, urban development and, and regional development. So I think that would be, you know, a good opportunity to um, scale up or, or, or replicate what we have been learning in in, uh, in Clark, New Clark City. For example, this is an example. There, there are several uh, other examples. Uh, so, yes, technical assistance is very important and, and, and there are opportunities for that. Similarly, technical assistance on projects that are under implementation. We have, you know, large projects under implementation. Uh, there are many opportunities that we can think about also. So we stop here. Yeah, no, thanks. thanks. Oh, one, one last thing also. We are currently preparing also, I mean, it's important that you keep that in mind. We are uh, currently preparing our next country partnership strategy, climate change, uh, will be a cross-cutting uh, team in the climate, I mean, uh, country partnership strategy. And we are currently um, coordinating with all sector government agencies to capture under the country partnership strategy how uh, we will shape our future programs. So, yeah. Great. Can I add one more thing? Sure. I, I want to add one last kind of reflection that I, because uh, Alan has inspired me. I think compared to UCCRTF and the the, the environment at which, in which it operated, particularly in the Philippines, I think URTF is uh, can aim for a lot more ambition because we have a kind of perfect trifecta for the next five years. We have a government administration that is strongly supportive of climate action and is resolving its governance issues or some of them. To, to deal with it. We have a, a different looking ADB with a different kind of aspiration and ambition on climate. So this is no longer the ADB where to convince project officers to do bits and pieces. This is a different ADB where project officers are convincing us to find time to do more bits and pieces, more than bits and pieces. And then finally, we have, as Alan pointed out, a country partnership strategy that may be the first one in the bank that is 
focused on climate action across all its pillars. We always address climate as a cross-cutting pillar and as a cross-cutting area, but this is the first one where it's actually focused across all its sectors. So I think it's a URT, for a URTF, it's a great opportunity to ramp up ambition and, and aim much higher than, than URCC, and building on the lessons, obviously, from URCC RTF. And, and this next country partnership strategy will guide uh, our country programming that is scheduled over the last, uh, the next four years, up to four to 4.5 billion US dollars uh, engagement every year with the government. So huge opportunities to um, to interact with uh, large investment for UCRTF. Right. RTF, sorry. That was a terrific summary and really interesting to hear about your your the country strategy. I mean, yesterday we launched a new um, development white paper that also very strongly prioritizes climate and links climate and, and poverty. But Charlotte may say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, um, I think what is that, I, but I would like to to just give the floor the opportunity to ask one or two questions. Oh, go. Thank you so much, uh, and I'm sorry I'm back, you know, to share my uh, some thoughts. So I'm now with Belinda, so who were part of a secretariat, UCCRTF secretariat, but we are now uh, working as a climate change specialist. So we are from CCRE, climate change, commer, resilience, commer, and environment, isn't it? So what I wanted to share and emphasize is ADB is moving very fast. So URTF builds on its own success and achievement uh, from you know, UCCRTF. When UCCRTF together with FCDO established uh, the UCCRTF, uh, ADB and the you know, FCDO at the time defeat established, uh, UCCRTF, climate change was emerging term, and uh, UCCRTF was one of the very unique stakeholders, you know, to uh, who promote climate change integrations into the project design and implementation, etc. But as we emphasized. The ADB is becoming the uh, the climate change bank of Asia and the Pacific, and the entire organization is really you know accelerate is geared towards climate change. So I, I think there's a situation. What I want to emphasize is UCC uh, URTF is one of the stakeholders working together with other you know department and the group of uh, specialists of ADB really, you know, towards uh, climate change. So I really uh, hope uh, in this different uh, setting. So, you know, we uh, work together to, uh, how can I say, to help, you know, URTF uh, make, uh, how can I say, you know, unique value addition and the help of the entire organization to better and more, what, what is that? Better and more, you know, climate resilience in our operations. Thank you. Thank you. Belinda, you want to add something? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Oh, again. Probably have to limit it to two more, I think. Yeah, thank okay. you very much. Um, my name is Alan Williams. And I'm part of the FCDO team uh, looking at the initial scoping for the Green Cities and Infrastructure Programme for FCDO. But I, I'm a consultant to the team. Um, what I've heard that, that extremely piqued my interest is the, the Philippines National Adaptation Plan and the new... Um, country partnership strategy for the Philippines. Um, obviously, these two um, documents will have a huge influence on, on what we can do as a scoping team. So, well, two questions, really. First of all, could you give us a, an idea of the current status of both of those? And secondly, could we have a more detailed conversation with you about them to, to help us 
with, with our scoping mission. Uh, ju just to give you a bit of background, the scoping will be for it, what's well, called the, the Green Cities and Infrastructure Programme. The main focus will be on uh, the sectors of um, water, water, energy, uh, transport and urban. That'll be the four major sectors that we'll be looking at, but uh, climate change, adaptability and, and so on will be very, very prominent features of all of these. Thank you. Do you want to respond quickly? I mean, I'm sure at least in terms, I'm sure you can continue the discussion, but Yes. Yeah. On, on the National Adaptation Plan, actually, the FCDO team is <laughs> if it's, uh, as involved as we are. So there is a draft uh, and uh, and it's a final draft already. I think what we're waiting for is final adoption by the government. But certainly, I think there's a draft that can be shared. It's been out for public consultation. Happy to chat about it. But FCDO team also, Jacques uh, leading uh, with Jasmine, uh, can also uh, highlight on that. Uh, thank you very much. So, so the preparation of the CPS country partnership strategy is ongoing now, and the objective is to have it uh, approved by the ADB board beginning of 2024. So it will be finalized uh, yeah, beginning of 2024 and published most probably in Q2 2024. Uh, as it is now, we are conducting consultations with different stakeholders uh, in the in the Philippines and also what we are doing is we do sector by sector assessments and strategic planning for each sector so that will be those documents are work internal working documents for ADB uh, that will uh, feed in the, the country partnership strategy uh, but uh, certainly we it could be it could be appropriate to to have a discussion with the the team of uh, URTF on on the CPS preparation. Actually, we are we are currently we are planning one-on-one um, -on -one discussions with development partners as well. So, but that we can integrate uh, URTF in the in the planning. Great. Any Thank final questions? Oh no, we've got to wrap up. So, um, uh, Right, I'm not going to try and summarise and don't have time anyway. Just say, I mean, we've heard, you know, terms like flexible, long term, really important. Building upon this triumvirate, of you say, as you said, of, of uh, you know, ADB experience and, and, and direction, fast moving, as, as, as you said, which is not normally a, a word you associate with a big bureaucracy. Um, uh, the, you know, government, certainly now governments, uh, you know, our, our, our um, partner governments are, are uh, very aware and, and I think positive about this agenda and and yes the 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 sort of political economy analysis that that we bring at post as well is all useful um private sector involving the private sector is really important but also really challenging uh being involved in the project cycle as early as possible but also at all stages is a is a huge bonus for for URTF yeah, lots of other things, but oh, that's actually two things. Firstly, I think we've learned that half a day for a roadshow is too short. And secondly, I think one thing we did get right is making the URTF acronym much easier to say than UCCRTF. But can I thank thank the panel? Um, really, really interesting insights. Can also thank, um, no, I, I'm not going to thank people because that's already happened. But I will just say, obviously, this, you know, this is 10 years plus another eight years. I will thank Verinda, who's been very heavily involved in in the the, the work today. He's he's moving on to a, a really interesting new position with the Indian government, um, advising on air pollution. So really important. Um, obviously, there's there's going to be changes in the team, uh, but I do thank the secretariat and everybody in the ADB who've worked so hard to make UCCRTF and URTF a real success. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you very much, John, and to our panelists. So I think this is going to be a very exciting time uh, working with the Philippine country office, uh, especially on the formulation of the country partnership strategy. So definitely the URTF team will touch base with the country office to pick up on this offer. Um, so now, finally, 
uh, we come to the closing of our event. For this, we have the pleasure of having Ms. Charlotte Coles, head of the Indo-Pacific Regional Department of UKFCDO, join us today. Charlotte is an international development professional who has worked in context from East Africa to South Asia and on a range of issues, including gender equality, climate change, and governance. She is now based in Glasgow, Scotland, with her husband and two young boys. So I'd like to invite Charlotte, please, to close today's event. Hello everyone, I will keep this extremely short because I'm sure you're all desperate for your lunch and we've run over and we don't want to let it go cold so I will I will be quick. First of all, what a fantastic morning. Thank you so much to all our speakers, all our panellists, all our moderators. I found it incredibly interesting and I will try and sort of capture some of the key things that I've taken away from today and that I will take back to me with me um, to my headquarters. Um, so I think first of all, um, we you know we heard from the kind of top level from the ADB and from from our, our ambassador here, Law, and I think it shows that we have that real kind of senior buy-in to what we're trying to do, and that this is such an important issue right up to the top of our organisations. Um, <clears throat> in session one, which was actually my favourite session because we actually got to hear from our partners who are actually doing the work on the ground and for me that is the most exciting bit um so i think we heard about your experiences of implementing urban resilience projects through the extremely long acronym uccrtf um we heard how provincial planners have been assisted and mentored um, in preparing uh, resilience roadmaps um, and really creating those bankable projects um, uh, we heard about building back better infrastructure after violent conflict. I loved hearing about the gender aspect of that program. It's something I'm personally quite passionate about. So that was brilliant to see. Um, and we heard about New Clark City, which I'm desperate to visit one day. I've had an invite, so fingers crossed. Um, and how, you know, a plan, an, a plan to canalise the river was changed through the you you with you know, the really long acronym um and and you know a decision was taken to actually let the river breathe let the river meander and that change of decision will have a huge impact for the people living in the city for its ability to adapt to climate change impacts and so i think that's just such an amazing value for money impact story that we have to tell um, and we heard about public private partnerships um, and how they've helped to develop project preparation studies um, for local um, PPP projects um, and get those ready for financing. Um, and I think the, the kind of lessons for me that came out of that session are around the need for capacity building and that that being such a huge part of what we do um, and the need for that to continue in the new project the need to be responsive to local needs and concerns it can't be a top-down process we have to be working from the bottom up as well um the 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 need to follow through so um i think there was a lot of so seed sown someone talked about you know the the trust fund sowed some seeds but we need to make sure that then follows through into real financing and actually making implementation happen um so we need a flow from the plat from the planning to the actual investment pipeline i think that's a theme that's come through quite strongly today overall then in session two we heard from satoshi varinda and shan again i thought it was a really informative session um really reflecting on the lessons that we can take from the first phase of this project um i think some of the things that i took away more engagement and upfront dialogue with government um, right at the start of projects i think that's so important um i think i took away that we need to optimize our operations and resources through the new adb structure and other people mentioned that this new structure could be quite an important opportunity for us to make the most of what we do um, policy dialogue. Um, so um, upstream work can unlock work downstream. So we talked about the fact that actually amending a, a policy guideline upstream can then have big impacts in terms of what you're actually, what kind of infrastructure you're able to um, put in place downstream. Um, important point for me using our country offices um so using you know um uh the people we have based here um and you know people like law our ambassador to um 
support with that kind of political economy knowledge and relationships with government counterparts. Um, you know, we are all partners. We can all we need to sort of draw on all the skills and knowledge that we have um, and, and have that three way collaboration between the ADB um, donor partners and national governments, making sure that communicate those communication channels are open at all time. Um, I took away that community led participatory planning um, approaches are really important to keep a focus on poor, vulnerable and the most marginalized. Um, innovation, it's a word that's come up quite a lot today. Um, it is an innovative project. Um, uh, the, you know, these are innovative projects and programs, we need to capture the lessons from them and then we need to disseminate them. You know, the new Clark City, the lessons from new Clark City could be really important um, to new Santana in Indonesia. How incredible would that be to be able to share those lessons? Um, and then working across sectors. Um, we we are terrible at doing this in FCDO. I'm, I'm, you know, how do we get health, uh, transport, uh, climate, all those different sectoral areas within the ADB talking to each other and collaborating because climate adaptation is completely cross-cutting across all those sectors. We can't just focus on one of those. And then finally, session three, we reflected on what next? How can we scale up the achievements of the UCCRTF through into the URTF? Um, and we heard about the fact that with the new NAP, um, Philippines new NAP, um, and with the new um, country partnership strategy, we have an opportunity to really embed this commitment and embed the URTF into these documents and make sure it's aligned with them. Um, and that should help with um, continuing to make sure that what we do through the URTF can be scalable and can scale up. We need to link what we do in the URTF to the big financing. We've heard about linking it to the big ticket items so that we are using the URTF to leverage bigger bits of financing and bigger money. Um, I thought a couple of challenges came up that were quite interesting. Financing for local governments, financing for cities. I think that's something we I'm taking away is to, to, to have a bit more of a think about. Um, and the partnership with the private sector. I think we've kind of cracked partnership with the private sector in mitigation activities. But adaptation is more challenging. So how do we bring the private sector on board and make it something attractive for them to invest in? I think that's something, again, that that we want to we want to have a think about. So, I mean, my main reflection coming out of this is just how much opportunity um, and excitement there is coming up. It feels like we're kind of on the edge of something in terms of having the nap in place having a new country strategy in place having a restructured um adb obviously scdo is is fairly new as, a, as an organization as well and it's brought together that development and that political piece um into one department so there's so much opportunity i think we're really well placed i think the urtf is really well placed to grasp those opportunities um, and the final thing I would say, John mentioned it, so um, I will tell you a little bit about it. Yesterday, we did launch a white paper on international development, um, which was, you know, it's a document that is completely aligned and in tune with what we're trying to do through the URTF, because its basic premise is we need to tackle extreme poverty and climate and support nature together, that those three challenges are completely interlinked and, and you cannot separate them. And that's what the URTF is. Fundamentally, that's what the URTF is saying. It's like when you develop infrastructure and try and make life better for people, you need to do it in a way that is resilient and which is adaptable to the climate and that is sensitive to nature. Um, so I think we are, you know, we are at the crux of, of, of those issues. Um, so again, I think you know, the white paper is is going to be a very helpful thing for me to be able to say, look, the white paper says this, and this is how we actually deliver it in reality in this region. So I just want to say again, thank you so much and have a fantastic lunch. Enjoy. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so this is the last time you're going to see me up front. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Your patience for our extension will be well rewarded with a buffet lunch. So please help yourself. So thank you again, and we look forward to working with you.